Okay, well, let's see. We're going to start another class, and we're finally up to seminar part three after, what, uh, 14 weeks of getting through the first, uh, first two parts. We're going to talk about dinosaurs and how they fit into the Bible. The reason I put so much emphasis on dinosaurs, I guess, in my ministry is because Christians are really confused by the topic, and I was confused by the topic as a, as a new Christian, and so many millions of kids are being brought into believing in evolution via the dinosaurs. That's what Satan is using, and so we've got to counteract this uh, doctrine that's being taught. The Bible says in Genesis 1-1, God created, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now this National Geographic issue says, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Now when I deal with kids, I will say, now hold it kids, does the guy that wrote this book, does he know that or does he think that? They say, well, he thinks that. There's no way he can know that. In order for him to know that is true, he would have to know every human being alive, wouldn't he? <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. He would have to know everybody that, everybody that ever lived. And I know he doesn't do that. So there's no way he can know that. He can only think that is true, and it's not true at all. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So if everything was made in six days, <clears throat> Adam must have seen dinosaurs. They had to be created with Adam <clears throat> somewhere during that first week. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 6, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And we covered this earlier, how that this firmament is probably a layer of water, uh, or the atmosphere, and a layer of water above this atmosphere. Uh, and there was also water under the crust of the earth. We'll get into a lot more of this on video uh, seminar part 6 when we get up to there in about 40 years, of uh, how the original creation was so different and how this water that was under the crust of the earth came shooting up to the surface. And that's where most of the flood water came from. The Bible tells us in uh, Psalm 136 and in Psalm 24 that the earth was made on top of the water. <clears throat> so there was a lot more water under the crust of the earth when God first made it. We'll get into that later. Anyway, before the flood came, from the creation until the flood, uh, the world was a lot different. People lived to be, you know, 900 years old, and things changed after the flood. But during this pre-flood era, we call it the Garden of Eden, but actually they were kicked out of the garden probably after 100 years, and the rest of the 1,500 years is still a beautiful world, but thorns and thistles and nothing like it was for the first 100 years, but still, you know, living 900 years old, so things were a lot different. I'm not sure exactly what the curse did to the world, and I don't know how, how much effect that had on things that Adam saw, but and there is not much preaching been done because there's not much scripture on the curse. We know what the flood did. I mean, that really wrecked it. But the curse apparently, certainly at least made the plants grow thorns and thistles. It might have been a recessive gene that became active. It might have been God just took his hand off and allowed certain things to happen. It's like if you don't ever work on your car, it's eventually going to break. And God said, that's it. I'm letting this place go to pot now. Whereas before, I don't know. I'm just giving some options. He was, may have been sustaining it before. But before the flood, they're living 900 years. After the flood, it dropped off to 400, then 200, and then 100, and today not many make it to 100. So it was a lot different back then. Now, reptiles during this time grew to be huge. See, reptiles never stop growing. At the end of your bones, there are certain kinds of cells that continually grow until you reach a certain age, and then they stop. That's why if you break your arm or your leg, if you break a bone when you're a child, and you break it right across the, near the joint, there's a good chance you may have an arm shorter than the other or a leg shorter than the other because you mess up those cells that are this where the growth takes place and it's only at the end of the bone. Reptiles don't have that. They grow all their life. They never stop. Uh, people stop growing, at least vertically, uh, when they're 16 or 18. I've seen them grow horizontally after that for a long time. But reptiles simply never stop growing. Eric, remember when we went to the uh, alligator gardens or what was that called? Alligator farm in uh, Orlando. We asked the guy, you know, how big do these alligators get? He said, well, we raise them under close to ideal conditions here. All of the ones in the pond are the same size, so there's no competition. There, aren't, there isn't a big one to eat the little ones. In, in this pond, it's all one-year-olds. In this pond, it's all two-year-olds. And he said, uh, we give them all the food they can, they can handle so they don't have to fight for it. And we get them from egg to, in one year, to five feet long. After two years, they're seven feet long. After three years, they're about eight feet long or something. They never stop growing, but the growth rate declines. 
Assuming this to be true before the flood, there's no reason it wouldn't be, the reptiles would grow to be huge. Dinosaurs were just big lizards in the Garden of Eden. So the obvious question comes up, do you think Noah took dinosaurs on the ark? Well, sure. People say, dinosaurs on the ark, they're kind of big, aren't they? Ferocious meat-eating T-Rex? Well, he wasn't a meat-eater until after the flood. Yeah, bring babies. I mean, Noah was 600 years old when he built the boat. He probably was smart enough by then to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones. <laughs> bring two babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. Uh, that'll be important later. There's a lot of reasons why you ought to bring babies, okay? Number one, they're smaller, obviously. They weigh less. Number two, or three, they eat less. Number four, they sleep a lot more. And uh, they're tougher. Kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. And plus, uh, they'll live longer after the flood to produce more offspring. And that's why you're bringing them to begin with. Why on earth would you bring an old one? <laughs> you know, you bring young ones and let them live longer after the flood. Um, it just makes sense. One of the debates I did, I don't know, if, Eric, if you saw that one, uh, debate number seven with the former preacher turned atheist. He said, how's Noah going to keep all those giraffes on that ark, you know, because they got that, you got to have a special sling to carry a giraffe because their neck will get hurt, you know, because they're, they're so tall. Well, he's assuming a full-grown giraffe. Baby giraffe, six feet tall, it's not a problem. They don't need the special sling for transportation. They're closer to the ground, they're tougher. Um, and they always look for stuff like that, you know. They, they, first, they pick an absurd example like one of the, how did he fit those billions of species of beetles on the ark? The question is always flawed, and you have to learn to watch for that. This scoffer said, how did he get, you know, he says he took seven of the clean, and the giraffe chews the cud and has a split hoof, so he'd have to take, you know, 14 giraffes, 14, you know, 15, 14, 15 foot tall giraffes on the ark, ha, 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 you believe that happened? I try to point out to him, first place, he took babies, okay. Secondly, what you believe is so much dumber. You believe a giraffe evolved from a rock <laughs> over 4.6 billion years ago. I don't understand how they can strain at the gnat and swallow such a camel. It's funny. It's, it's hard not to laugh at them, so I go ahead and laugh at them because <laughs> it, it, it really is dumb. But, uh, you know, our ob Satan has them blinded, that's all. We should try to win them to the Lord, you know. They're just blinded by the devil into believing that dumb theory. So Noah took two of everything. God told him, all you got to do is read the Bible carefully, and it tells us the solution. God said, I want you to bring two of every sort, not two of every species. What happened in the mid-1800s, uh, they started arguing about, you know, the, a doctrine was taught, and many teachers taught this, called the fixidity of the species. So if there's a certain animal, like a... Um, a dog like the Alaskan Husky that really is comfortable and survives in cold weather and would be miserable down in hot weather, probably wouldn't survive. I mean, if, if, he, if somebody was chasing him, he's got all that hair on him, he would overheat quickly. Whereas, uh, you know, a short-haired dog like a dingo is very comfortable in hot weather like Australia. You put him up in Alaska, he's going to freeze, okay? So, some people are going around teaching, well, this proves God made the dingoes in Australia for Australia, and he made the huskies in Alaska for Alaska. There's no change in the species. So Doc, uh, Darwin came around and rebelled against that teaching, and he was right to do that. I mean, that was dumb what they were teaching. The people were teaching the fixidity of the species. Species never change. Well, the question is, what is a species? The Bible doesn't use the word species. The Bible says, I want you to bring them after their sort, the same sort of animal. If you read Genesis 7, a bunch of times in this chapter, it says, bring the beast after his kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. I mean, I think God wanted us to get the message. It's the basic kinds, not the species. So the argument is not species, it's kinds. And if you're going to get into a discussion or a debate or an argument on creation or evolution, I would encourage you to stay away from the word species because nobody's ever gotten a good definition for it. They'll say, well, animals that normally breed together are same species. Okay, well, a dog and a wolf are different species. Canis lupus and Canis domesticus. But they can still breed and have puppies. So what's your definition of species again? There isn't a good definition. Now, the biblical kind, if you go back and read Genesis, God says they're going to bring forth after their kind. So the way you tell what a kind is, is were they originally able to bring forth offspring? 
that could also bring forth offspring. Bring forth uh, not sterile offspring. A horse and a mule today, a horse and a jackass can, can crossbreed and make a mule, which is almost always a male, and all the males are sterile, I believe. About one in 20,000 is born that is, that is not sterile. But then either those kids are sterile or they become back to a horse or, or a jackass. So there's a good possibility that the horse and the jackass had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But stand back and look at them. You're talking about the same kind of animal. You know, This doesn't prove the horse and the banana have a common ancestor, that's for sure. So, and the God, God told him to bring all those in whose nostrils was the breath of life and those on dry land. Now here's what will happen. Some skeptic or scoffer will, will f figure out how many species of animals there are in the world. He won't figure the kinds, he figures the species. And then he figures including all the fish and including all the insects, and he says there are X number of million species in the world. Well, this number is derived because modern day scientists have decided that certain animals are different species. But if you stand back and look at them, they're the same kind of animal. I mean, we've got dog, wolf, coyote. There's three simple examples that are the same kind of animal and probably had a common ancestor, but they're three different species. So they will set up a straw man by claiming there are millions of species in the world, and there are. Mil way too many species to go on the ark. Way too many. And they'll say, are there too many species to fit on the ark? I say, I agree. But you think it happened? You think what happened? You think he put all those species on the ark? Oh, no, no. I think he put all the kinds on the ark. He brought them after their sort, only those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and only those on dry land. Take out the fish. Take out the insects. They don't breathe through nostrils. Insects absorb oxygen through their skin. Which spiracles? spiracles, right. It's called a spiracle. It's a hole in the skin where they pull oxygen in, and that's how they get it. And we get into the surface area to volume ratio problem. Did we do that in the, one of the classes here? Yeah. As a as an insect gets larger, it ends up effectively having less skin per cubic inch of meat, and so it can't get enough oxygen to breathe. So, so why do we have insects on? Well, we have insects that aren't as big. We still have them. They're just not as big. Were they on the ark? Oh, yeah. No, some insects might have been on the ark, but they didn't have to be. Insects can survive a flood just fine. They would, many insects can burrow in the mud. Uh, some spiders can take an air bubble down with them and build their nest underwater, you know. Um, it doesn't take much air to keep an insect happy for a long time. Plus, I suspect during the flood you would get turbulent uh, uh, areas where you would have, you know, stuff trapped. The, the big thing, I, I think most of the insects survived on floating dead material, log mats. Let's suppose you have a flood. Go, go any place where there's a flood going on and just watch out like in a river, raging river. There's all kinds of stuff floating down the river. How long would a person last on a log floating around? Yeah, a week, maybe, if he's lucky, right? Sure. He's going to fall asleep, you know, so sooner or later. <laughs> now, how long would an insect last on a floating log mat? Yeah. Build a new colony. All right? Start a family. <laughs> I mean, so insects survive floods. Today we have all these varieties of dogs, and they probably came from a common ancestor. It was a dog. And Noah probably never saw a chihuahua. Most of the dogs we have today are through selective breeding because some guy decided, well, you know, I'd like to have a little bitty dog to keep in my lap. Not like yours, Jan. Your, your dog still gets in your lap, that big old Saint Bernard, or, uh, German Shepherd, not anymore? Yeah, what is she, 100 pounds now? Or? No, she's only 75. Only 75, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Still, some people, like the Chinese, they, they, it's a real big deal with them to raise particular dogs for particular purposes, you know. Some dog is born with some slight deformity or something, and they'll say, you know, I really like that. Let's, uh, let's, Let's crossbreed that and develop this trait, and you end up with a pug, you know, the nose caved in. Looks like it's been chasing parked cars all of its life or something. And there are 250 varieties of dogs, some say 400, you know, varieties of dogs in the world today. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua. Most of the dogs we have have been crossbred or specially bred for some particular purpose, like the dachshund. Half a dog high, dog and a half long. Those were special bred to go chase something down a hole, a weasel, I think, you know, because somebody wanted to hunt weasels or whatever it was, you know. So they kept finding dogs with shorter and shorter legs, and they'd, pretty soon you got a whole species of those things. Or not a species, you got a whole, a whole variety of dog. Now, like our dog Nicky over there, he's a canardly, 
And I tell folks you can hardly tell what kind he is, so he's a canardly. But uh, the generic dogs is what they probably had on the ark. It's a very good possibility that the horse and the zebra have a common ancestor and the burrow. Stand 30 feet away and look at them, folks. You're talking about the same kind of animal. This doesn't prove a horse and a banana have a common ancestor. And I always use an ex absurd example like that to try to shock them into reality and think, wow, you're right. I, what I believe is dumb. And could you be accused of setting up a straw man like that? Or that, no, that's really a fact. that is what they teach. Yeah. I'm, I'm not... Like saying, you know, you believe this came from a rock. Uh, some people are just setting up a straw man. I get them all the time get mad at me for saying that. And I say, okay, it, in what I, is what I'm saying correct? Do you believe we came from a rock? And they'll say, not directly, no. Okay, well, <laughs> indirectly, yeah, do you believe it? I'll give you all the billions of years you want. Time is not, I'll give you 50 zillion years. Do you think we came from a rock? And they have to say yes. But they don't want to say yes because then they might realize how dumb this is. Willingly, Willingly ignorance is the best way I can describe it. Okay, skeptics will say, how did Noah fit those millions of animals on the ark? I always will say, well, how many animals are there? Yeah. How many were there? I don't know. There's about 8,000 different kinds of animals, according to uh, Creation X and Hilo magazine back in 97. And I don't know how many kinds there are. I don't know how many original created kinds there were. I don't think anybody here does either. But 8,000 is a reasonable number. So uh, he only had to bring land animals, only bring those with nostrils. That wipes out all the bugs, all the insects. Uh, bring babies, of course, that's just common sense. Bring two of each kind, not two of each variety. So. And then the skeptics, when they say, you know, I couldn't put all those animals on the ark, the two questions I ask them, how many were there? How many animals were there? They say they don't know. And I, I say, how big was the ark? They say, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's real objective science, you know. Uh, they don't even know what they're talking about. They just really don't like the idea of a Bible that is accurate because, you know, that might mean they're in trouble someday. It really is a either conscious or subconscious desperate attempt to eliminate God's authority in their life. That's why the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. They just don't like the idea that God has the authority to judge sin. Well, I'm sorry. He does, and he's going to do it again. <laughs> and you better get ready for it. So, the skeptics believe, of course, 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, and then it de developed a hard rocky crust as it cooled down, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This is what the textbooks teach. Millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, I guess it is. So slow it stopped, it doesn't even happen. Nobody's ever seen it happen. Now, for years, people have done experiments and proven that non-living material does not come to life. That is called spontaneous generation. That'll be a good quiz question, Becky. Spontaneous generation is the belief that non-living material can come to life. 200 years ago, there were formulas in books, how to create mice. Put a bunch of old rotten rags and wheat in a corner of a building and leave it for three weeks and it will turn into mice. Well, duh. <laughs> okay. Let's say take a piece of rotten meat, set it outside for four days, it'll create flies. Flies are created by rotting meat. That's what they taught. Well, of course, Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur came along and did their experiments and proved, hey, folks, it doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen, okay? Non-living material does not come alive. But here's a textbook in 1994 teaching the kids, progress from a chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Now this is sheer baloney. Now he's welcome to believe that. I don't care what this author believes. But that's not science. That doesn't belong in a science book, that's for sure. Here's a college textbook. Look what it says. The first self-replicating, in other words, able to reproduce, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. They have to watch, in the evolutionist literature, they use that word emerged all the time. You know, 
Man emerged from the apes. Life emerged from the soup. What does that mean? I mean, explain that to me, would you please? So what happens is they're able to psychologically hide behind that word emerged. Well, it must have happened, you know, we emerged. <laughs> it's meaningless. Doesn't mean a thing. There, it's, not, it's not empirical. There's no scientific data to back this up. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. Nobody's ever seen soup come alive. It just doesn't happen. Um, so they believe, you know, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. And I will try, I try to be sweet about it, but it's, it's so fun to be sarcastic, I guess, uh, that I have a blast. If you're having the same problem, Eric, it's just fun. It's tough to be sweet, but you try, you know. Um, I like to make fun of what, I guess I have the Elijah personality in me, you know. What's the matter, is your God sleeping? Cry a little louder, huh? <laughs> you know, so. We need some people in the creation movement that are sweet and gentle and, you know, work with these folks. And bless God, I thank, I'm thank, thankful there's people like that. But it's not me. I'm not one of them, okay? You know, you need the Air Force, but you also need the Marines to get in there and blow stuff up, you know. <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah. Um, and then you need people to go in and fix things, you know. And, you know, they need the politicians to go in there and mess it up again so we can have another war 20 years later and let the bankers get rich again. Uh, right. So I will show them. I have learned in debates or in talking to people, one of the most effective things you can do is to show them what they believe instead of just tell them what they believe. Because somehow when you say, four billion years ago, the brain shuts off. You can't comprehend four billion years, and so you just think, well, it must have happened. But when you put it on a timeline and say, okay, look what you guys believe. 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, what exploded? Where did it come from? 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down. Has anybody ever seen a planet form? No. no. Is there any evidence you can get a bunch of fragments together and it'll form a perfectly round ball? How did all this stuff melt and get together? The Earth doesn't have enough heat to do that. Is it all bombarded? I mean, you can go on and on on this problem right here. Nobody's ever seen this happen. Then, how did, the, how did life start? Nobody's ever seen that happen. But they believe it did, so I will tell them, you know, that, that what they think is silly. And they'll say, well, you think all the dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? I say, well, yeah. Do you think all the dogs came from a rock? <laughs> and it shocks them. Wow, wait a minute. That, that is crazy, isn't it? Here's the evolutionist life verse, you know. Saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. Uh, from my dad's life verse, Lord have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, here we have a flood in the days of Noah. Where is the evidence for this? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, Everybody's corrupt. The earth's full of violence. I'm going to destroy the world. Build an ark. So God's, Noah said to the boys, hey, go for wood. We're going to build us a boat. <laughs> and so they went for wood. Well, go for wood. People have argued what go for wood is. Some people think it's white oak. I don't know. Other people think that word means laminated. Make the ark out of laminated wood. Uh, if you cross grain wood, you know, you turn it cross grain to itself, it becomes much stronger. You know, the guys who do karate will tell you, if you're going to break a board, you break it with the grain, it's not hard. Get two boards to cross grain to each other and break it. You know, break a, piece, break a half inch piece of plywood. Or remember when <laughs> Robbie, we told him to rip, rip that plywood for us. He was working for us. Poor guy, he didn't know what we meant. You know, it's just a term used in construction, rip, rip this plywood, a you know, sheet of plywood. We came back and he had, he, huge strong guy, he had actually ripped about that far down the sheet of plywood. <laughs> I said, what have you done? He said, you told me to rip the plywood. I don't see how you guys do this so straight. <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, oh, Robbie, we use a saw, you know. <laughs> uh, some people think gopher wood means laminated. I don't know. Okay, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But after the flood was over, Noah's son, Shem, had a boy and named him Arphaxad. Now, who on earth would name a kid Arphaxad? <laughs> I don't know. But Shem did. Now, don't you think Arphaxad, one day, he got big enough. He started to become aware of the world around him. It's neat when that happens to kids. All of a sudden it's like, thumb. <laughs> They'll look at it for hours. Where did that thing come from? <laughs> Has that been there all along? Or foot, wow. Anyway, I'm sure one day our facts had gotten big enough. He's sitting on Grandpa Noah's lap, and he looks around. He says, hey, Grandpa Noah, how come we're the only people in the whole world? 
Eventually that thought's going to cross his mind, don't you think? Where is everybody? And Grandpa Noah is going to tell him the story about the flood. I am convinced that Adam and Eve were able to tell the story of the creation to many generations. I wouldn't split a church over it like some people would, but I don't think Adam and Eve had a belly button. That would be a great object lesson for the great, 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 great grandkids. Hey kid, come here, look at this. Wow, Grandpa, how come you don't have a belly button? <laughs> well, let me tell you a story, son, you know. It was, it's just an object lesson, I suspect they didn't, there's no reason for them to have one. Uh, by the way, it's the fad in California now. If they go to people who do ear piercing and body piercing and all this. They have some kind of surgery, they eliminate your belly button. It's gone. They say you can't tell it was ever there. I think the trees would have had rings because uh, trees give the laminate effect. If trees, had, if God created trees with rings, ex nihilo, yeah. they would have had rings. So animals probably had a n n n n n n navel. navel ring. Uh, that's why the church in California split <laughs> over that question. Did Adam and Eve have a belly button? And the one church, they went across town and started a new church, of course, called the Church of the Navalites. I, like I said, I wouldn't split a church over it. I, don't, I wouldn't preach it as doctrine, but I think it's uh, interesting. Anyway, Noah then is going to tell the story to our fact set about the flood, or Shem would. Actually, Noah and Shem lived long enough to tell the story to a whole bunch of their grandkids. Now, Shem lived long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is a question of whether he knew Jacob or not. And Eric, you might be aware of the controversy here. How old was Terah when Abram was born? He was either 70 or 130. We might have to shift the last three, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, shift them over 60 years because of other references in Scripture. Okay, if you read in the timeline, on my timeline that I have, my chart, there are some reference notes here about this. And uh, Henry Morris has a good note about this, this discrepancy of 60 years uh, in one of his books, which is referred to in here. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Certainly Noah, either way, uh, Shem lived long enough to know Abraham and Isaac and possibly Jacob, okay, depending if you shift the chart over to 60 years or not. But just some, somebody will get a hold of you someday and say, oh, that's not accurate because, you know, uh, they'll give you some other reference of how old somebody was. And by the time you chase down all the genealogies, it still is a little confusing, but it, it possibly should be shifted over 60 years. I don't know. It's not a big deal. Anyway, the story of the flood is going to be passed down generation after generation, and it, they can all go back and verify it with Noah. I mean, he's still alive. So today, 4,400 years later, there are still 270 surviving flood stories that have been found. That'll be a quiz question. How many flood legends have been found? Those are 270. 270 existing flood legends from cultures all over the world. And when you read them, it's amazing to see the similarity between the biblical account and these flood legends 4,400 years later. For instance, the Hawaiian legend says, long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it, filled it with animals. The waters come up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Now here we have a legend that is very similar to the Bible. You have one family saved in a great canoe full of animals from a flood. Um, the Chinese, the oldest known story I believe in China is called the High King Classic which tells about a guy named Fu Hai that they say is the father of their civilization. The story goes that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. After the flood, they were the only people left on earth, and they repopulated the world. So here you have a story with one man, three sons, and three daughters, and his wife, eight people, saved on a boat from a flood. I don't know that the Fu Hai story mentions the animals, but it still, it, it would tie in. The Tolik Indians in Mexico, their oldest... Hmm? Do we have a book that sells these, uh, these books? This is in the book, Dinosaurs by Design, the red hardback book, uh, okay. right there, by Dwayne Gish. This, these are where I got these pictures from. Um, the Tolik Indians in Mexico, now he only has a few of the stories, okay? Um, who, a guy called me a few weeks ago that is collecting as many stories as can be found. He's going to publish a book with all just the stories in it. Somebody keeps sending me every couple months, they send me, because they're doing research, they're spending their lifetime researching Tower of Babel stories. 
Indian cultures that will say, oh yeah, there was a time when everybody spoke one language, but now we all speak different languages because, you know, they, and sometimes the stories get kind of wild, you know, because somebody, you know, cut off a snake's head and the snake, you know, bit him on the foot and said, now you're going to speak a new language, you know. The stories get kind of wild, the mythology, but they, the idea is universal that everybody did speak one language at one time. Forked tongue, I guess they would. When, uh, the Tolik Indian legend says, <clears throat> the first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a great flood. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. Well, 1,716 years is interesting because the Bible says it was 1656 if you add up the dates in the Bible. Now, I don't know if there are gaps in the genealogies and that could go, that discussion would go for hours and hours. You know, there are some problems between the chronologies and the genealogies. There's a few extra people mentioned in there. And if you read the Henry Morris's Defender's Bible, he's got great explanation for that. Sometimes it says, you know, Abraham was the father of David. Well, obviously he's not the father of David. He's the great, 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 great grandfather of David. But it's just a Hebrew, uh, what do they call it, idiom, or is there another name for it? Colloquialism? Yeah. He, it's just a way of expression of saying, you know, he's the father. So there may be a few gaps in our genealogies. I don't think uh, it's not serious, and there are some other places that close up an awful lot of the gaps, where it says, for instance, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, it says that in the book of Jude. Well, if Enoch is the seventh from Adam, then that closes up many gaps there, right? Yeah. Um, the Bible dates, though, of 1656 may or may not be exactly correct. And that's why, in, in here my seminars, I always say about 6,000 years ago and about 4,400 years ago, technically this should be 4,356, uh, 43, 44, whatever it is. Uh, but it, I just round it off, okay, because I don't think you can get the exact dates. The legend, though, of the Tolik Indians is only 60 years different from the Bible story. So here you have people in Mexico maintaining a legend for thousands of years, people in Israel maintaining their Bible for thousands of years, and when we finally put them both together, 4,000 years later, it's only 60 years off. Not bad. Um, the Babylonians have a legend about this. Uh, uh, lots and lots of stories. There's a great book by Bill Cooper called After the Flood. I don't know if you've seen that one yet, Eric. I got it in my office. We almost decided to carry that book as, you know, and I still may someday, because it's really good. He traces the genealogies of at Noah's three sons. Where did they go? He goes back and who was the first king of uh, France, the first king of or leader of England? And he's really done incredible work with genealogies. Now, uh, Bill Cooper is very, very sick, I understand, possibly dying uh, over in England is where he lives with cancer or something. But um, the book is tremendous called After the Flood. If you want to get more detail on that, you can get it, I know, from ICR. If you call our ministry, if you get this tape and want one, we can order you one. We'll get one for you. Um, but Mount Ararat is located in the corner of where Turkey and Russia and Iran come together. Now, it's a pretty good distance from Iraq as opposed to Iran, which used to be called Persia. But uh, on a Turkish map, this area is called Noah on Gomshi. Noah's big boat. I had a fellow in a seminar one time was really angry at me. He said, it doesn't say big boat, it just says Noah's boat. So, okay. Sorry. <laughs> this is from Ron Wyatt's book, uh, Noah's big, <coughs> big Boat. Ron's been there many, many times to that region. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, it's interesting, it rested the seventh month, but he didn't get out till the thirteenth month. Why would you stay in there for six more months? Several reasons. Number one, there's nothing to eat outside. I mean, go someplace where they just had a flood, go out and stand in the middle of the flood plain, the mud, there's nothing there. No McDonald's. <laughs> nothing. All the animals would die if you let them out. There's nothing to eat out there. How long would it take, how long does it take if you plant a garden how long until you can eat the, the fruit of your garden? Three or four months, right? He stayed in six more months. Plenty of time for seeds that were floating around to begin to grow again. There'd be food out there. Trees probably wouldn't be very tall. I mean, I, I think when Noah got off the ark, it was nothing over a few feet tall. Some plants, you know, bamboo grows real fast. Maybe some stuff 10 feet tall or 15 feet. But basically, it, it was a ruined world. And a lot of people think that after the flood, Noah's sons, at least one of them, 
became bitter over that beautiful world was destroyed. Why would God do that? The people before the flood weren't that bad, were they? And we tend to look at sin from our perspective instead of God's perspective. God hates sin. He just isn't going to tolerate it. He's going to judge the world. He's going to do it again, by the way, any day. Uh, but it says the ark rested in the mountains of Ararat. Mountains is plural. Now this is important. There are those people who teach that Noah's ark is on Mount Ararat. I have read many books. This is an awesome book by Nathan Meyer. He's convinced it's on Mount Ararat. Ken Ham is convinced it's on Mount Ararat. Carl Baugh is convinced it's up there. John Morris and uh, Stephen Austin from ICR are convinced it's on Mount Ararat. And it might be, I don't know. But what I have read, and I think I've read everything that is uh, nearly everything published on this topic from, from these people who I respect, they will say, you know, we went up on Mount Ararat and we got struck by lightning and there were rock slides and landslides and there's pillow lava up there. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. And then they'll say, you know, the, we just almost saw Noah's Ark. Well, how do you almost see something? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there are stories about the Russians going in there in 1916 or 17, you know, photographing the ark, coming back with all the data, and then the revolution started. And it was all lost who knows where, you know, during the Bolshevik Revolution. So, I don't know. I'm willing to listen to both sides. But here's what happens. The people who believe it is on Mount Ararat have spent a lot of time raising money for these expeditions. And they get really bent out of shape if you even suggest it might be someplace else. And so some good creationist groups have ostracized me, or they won't recommend my ministry because I even mentioned that there's another option. I'll say, well, you know, maybe you might want to look someplace else. The Bible doesn't say it landed on Mount Ararat. You ought to try this. Get, get something floating in a bathtub and have something rise up under it. What's the chances of it landing on that rising object? It's going to float off to the side. It won't land on the rising object. It could, I suppose, but it's highly unlikely. Mount Ararat is made of a special kind of lava called pillow lava. Pillow lava occurs when a volcano erupts underwater. As soon as the lava comes out, it cools quickly. And so it looks like a pillow, for lack of a better word, and so they call it pillow lava. In Hawaii, I've been over there three times, uh, they, volcano, when it erupts, if, if it has time to cool down, it cracks you know, a different kind of lava as, and then if it cools instantly. When the lava's flowing right into the ocean, big steam cloud, and it cracks up into sand, breaks it all up. Uh, the black sand beaches in California, I don't know if you remember that, Eric, you might have been too young, but we used to go just north of San Francisco, we would see the uh, black sand beaches that were obviously from a lava flow that flowed down and hit the water and cooled off and broke up quickly, made this uh, black sand. Mount Ararat is obviously a volcano that erupted underwater because of the type of lava it is made out of, called pillow lava. Um, and there are some folks who th are convinced it's up on Mount Ararat. I think it is possible that as a volcano is rising up or as the mountains are lifting up, that the ark would get snagged on the side as it comes up, but I think it's unlikely. It is more likely that an ark would come to rest in what is called a nested area. If, a mountain, if the mountains are lifting up under the water, if there is a, a small pool that slowly drains off, you know, surrounded by a ring of mountains, that's called a nested area, it's more likely for, for a floating object to get caught there and settle out in a plain somewhere. Many people think this is Noah's Ark right here. This is a boat-shaped object. It is 17 miles away from Mount Ararat. Now, Ron Wyatt was a good friend of mine. He died about a year and a half ago. His uh, website, wyattmuseum.com, uh, has all sorts of data on this topic if you think, if you want to study this object right here as being a possibility for being Noah's Ark. Richard Reeves is a friend of mine. He took over for Ron Wyatt. He has been there many times. There's a picture of Richard with Mike and I out by the climbing wall. Um, Richard and his family have been down here several times and Rick, they've got a museum up there just south of Nashville that is worth stopping and seeing if you want to see the museum, uh, Wyatt Museum. Um, the guys who think it's down in the valley, this is information about the, the ark down in the valley, okay, if that's it. They say it has collapsed in on itself and folded out to the side. Now this term, Eric, you might want to learn, uh, when a boat it falls out to the side, it is splayed. S-P-L-A-Y. 
splay is a, a boat will, you know, if the boat isn't built just right, it'll just fold out to the side. You don't want that to happen while you're, uh, while you're swimming or floating around in it. But an old wooden boat, you know, pe when, I, when I people mention about Noah's Ark, I say, first of all, let me explain. It's been 4,400 years. I'm not sure anything is left of a wooden boat. Maybe nothing, maybe there is no ark. It's a, there's a possibility that for the, for the last 4,000 years, people have been going there breaking off pieces to take home for a souvenir, and it's gone. You know, like the Catholics, when they become a priest, they will get a piece of the original cross of Jesus. Well, somebody figured out there's enough pieces of the cross of Jesus to build about four cities now. <laughs> he was strong carrying that thing up the hill. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. The best two possibilities seem to be that it's on Mount Ararat or it's down in the valley. Now, there's a third group that says it's over in Iran. It's not even in, not even in Turkey. It's in a different country. There's, no, there's a series of mountains over there where they think it is. Now, Bob Cornuke has spent a lot of time searching over there. He thinks it's over in Turkey in this mountain range, only because of the verse that says they journeyed from the east to the plains of Shinar. And he says if you're going to journey from the east to the plains of Shinar, you have to go from Iran to Baghdad, which is where the plains of Shinar are. Shinar are? Shinar were. Uh, they are still. Anyway, he's assuming, I think, of course, by that, that when they built the Tower of Babel, they, they stood, stayed right where the ark was. By the time they get to where they journeyed over to build the Tower of Babel, this is 200 years later. I don't think they stayed right at the ark for 200 years. I mean, they could have walked over to Iran. It's not that far away. Okay? And then journey to the east. So I don't know. I don't know where the ark is. But Ron Wyatt's site is pretty convincing to me. They found iron rivets in that region. Of course, we know they had iron before the flood came. Tubal-Cain was an artificer in brass and iron, the Bible says. And it could be they, they actually bolted the ark together with the big rivets. Ron had several of them. I held them in my hand. Um, it looks like, just like you would do a rivet today, a large steel pin, maybe an inch diameter, where you put a big washer over it and then beat the head to round it out. And it squeezes the wood together and it can't come apart. This is typically how a rivet is done. When I worked at General Motors, I ran the rivet gun for a while, putting the frames of the trucks together. You drop this pin in, about as big as your thumb. It's already got a round head on one side. You drop it in the hole and you get this big machine that's held up by a little crane and you have a motor you can control it. It's like a big C-clamp. You put it over the rivet and it squeezes it down into a ball on both sides of the metal, like a pop rivet, only this is as big as your thumb. And for joke, some of the guys at General Motors would take just the rivet gun, put a rivet in it, and squeeze it, and it squeezes it into a perfect ball, or close to a perfect ball, but it's red hot. All that pressure produces heat. Then you toss it to somebody, here you go. <laughs> you know, it happened all the time at General Motors, I'm sorry about that. I didn't do it, of course. The other guys did it. Uh, but anyway, these rivets that are found up there are very convincing that they are indeed from Noah's Ark. And the skeptics will always set up a straw man and they'll say, you know, like the, the former preacher turned atheist. He said, Noah couldn't build a wooden boat that big and they didn't know how to work with iron back in those days. They were dumb. Yeah, in other words, I'm smart, everybody else is dumb. <laughs> that's what he's trying to say. And that's always what it boils down to. Uh, the government of Turkey studied the problem carefully and they own the property. And they are convinced that this is Noah's Ark down in the valley. Now, the guys who think it's up on the mountain are coming back and they're saying, well, the reason they said that is because they don't want people coming over here looking for it. So they just said this to keep people out of the country. That's their excuse. You need to be aware of that. Um, they, the Turkish government even built a visitor center there. Apparently, it's not a safe place to go now, though, because people are getting killed there because of all the Kurds that got driven out of uh, Iraq are now living up in that region. They're nomads, you know, have no place to live, refugees. Uh, X Creation X to Hilo magazine has published uh, several very nasty articles claiming this is not Noah's Ark done in the valley, and they give all their evidence. When this article came out in the Creation magazine, the first thing I did is I think what any Christian should do. They were in this magazine blasting Ron Wyatt, saying it's not Noah's Ark. I called Ron Wyatt. I said, Ron, let me read this article to you. I read the whole article. He was able to answer every objection. One of the things they show in this magazine, and I recommend Creation Magazine. You know that. I mean, we love it. It's a great magazine. I encourage you to get it. But they have blasted this uh, 
other site of Noah's Ark several times in their magazine because they've spent a lot of money looking for it on Mount Ararat. <clears throat> so one of the pictures they show shows a satellite image of the region there and it shows two more boat-shaped objects. And they said, see, that's not Noah's Ark, it's just a boat-shaped object because there's two more of them in the area, kind of like this, you know. And they're not too far from each other. So I called Ron. I said, Ron, what do you say about that? They're showing pictures in here of two more boat-shaped objects that look just like yours. Why do you think yours is Noah's Ark? He said, well, Brother Hoven, you taught science. Tell me, when mud flows around an object, if there's a mudslide coming down a hill and hits a big boulder, it's going to flow around it, right? I said, that's right. He said, one end is going to be pointed, the other end is going to be rounded. I said, right. He said, the pointed end is at the bottom. You can tell which way the mud flowed by the pointed end. Mud flowed that way, right. The rounded end is the same thing when an airplane wing. It's round on the front, pointed on the back. The air flows over it just right that way, okay? He said, you're right. There are several more of these objects in that region, but now go back and look at the one I say is Noah's Ark. It's backwards. The rounded end is downhill. That's a good answer. I think you at least ought to give the guy a chance to, to defend himself. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I was satisfied with all of his answers, and I recommend if you're gonna, going to get into the study of Noah's Ark, and you, I don't know which site it is, maybe it's neither, all right? But I recommend you read all the books from both sides and really decide. I've decided I don't know, but I'm fairly convinced that it's probably down in the valley. I'm still willing to listen, and if that makes some other creation ministries blackball me because I make that statement, well, then grow up, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think if you're going to research, you ought to study all the possibilities, all right? Um, what they're doing, I think, they're doing the very same thing that the evolutionists do. We want the kids to see our view and don't let creation in the schools. And we got a bunch of creationists that are convinced it's on Mount Ararat. They don't want anybody to see any other evidence for the other side. And I think that's just childish, my personal opinion. Okay, Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says the ark is 300 cubits long. Now, Moses did not write Genesis. Moses was the editor of Genesis. There are 10 different authors for Genesis. And it's divided up in the Bible when it says, these are the generations of, that's the break point. That's called a teledoth. They're signing off and then somebody else takes over. And I've put together stuff, Eric, for seminar part seven in the question answer, you know, where are the 10 sections of Genesis? Some people say 11. Apparently God wrote chapter one and the first few chapters of, first few verses of chapter two. And then Adam took over and Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. If you look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's very fascinating. Every time, I think in Genesis 1, in the 31 verses, it refers to God 31 times. And it says, God, every time. When you get to chapter 2, it says, Lord God, every time. Interesting. There are very obvious changes in style at 10 different times in Genesis. Uh, Terry Pruitt, I've debated him three times now. He's a Genesis scholar, and he says there are four different authors to Genesis, and they were all just you know, do it, doing it for political purposes. It's a bunch of priests got together and tried to say Moses wrote this book. The Bible never claims Moses wrote Genesis. The Bible claims Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the first five books are called the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses. But that's because Moses edited Genesis. He took the clay tablets that were probably passed down. Probably Noah took the first few chapters on the, on the ark with him clay tablets that he got from Adam or, or Methuselah or somebody. Methuselah lived long enough and is probably the key character. He lived long enough to know Adam for a long time and he knew Noah for a long time. He would have been a perfect overlapping person to know both, you know, and say, here's the tablets I got. These are the sacred records. Protect them. You know, all you got to do is scratch on a piece of clay and then let it bake in the sun and it's permanent pottery, you know. And that's how a lot of stuff was preserved. Okay. <coughs> The Bible says the ark is 300 cubits long. Since Moses was the editor of Genesis, he probably used the Egyptian cubit. If I was going to write a book and talk about something, I would probably not use ruples if I said, oh, this car cost, you know, 80 million ruples. Now, you folks, you know, that speak Russian, to you, that means something, a ruple, right? One ruple is worth, what, 
Zero? <laughs> Very close, right? It used to be worth a lot of money, didn't it? Economies change all the time, you know. Our dollar today is equal to three cents of what it was just not even a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, three cents would buy what a dollar buys today. One ounce of gold. An ounce of gold costs, oh, $300, $400. Okay, the price varies all over the place. For $400, bucks, you can buy a nice tailor-made suit. You can go have a custom-made suit and a brand new pair of shoes for 400 bucks, right? One ounce of gold. 150 years ago, when the cowboys were settling the West, one ounce of gold was 20 bucks. And with that, you could buy a tailor-made suit and a new pair of shoes. See, the price of things has not gone up. The value of the dollar has gone down. That's all that's happened. It still takes an ounce of gold to do the same thing it did uh, 200 years ago. This is a stable, this is a stabilizing factor. And when our country went off of the gold standard, whew, that was the beginning of the end financially. Uh, I don't normally carry one with me, I just brought one. We're teaching on it tonight in class. Uh, the 300 cubits, though, Moses probably used the Egyptian cubit because that was what he was raised with. A cubit is from your elbow to your fingertip. So that'll be a quiz question. What is a cubit? The way we get standards of measurements are interesting. Um, an inch, for instance, was the width of somebody's thumb. A, uh, oh, hang on. There. Now, a foot, for instance, was the length of somebody's foot. You know, and a yard was from your fingertip to your nose. For somebody, it's not mine, mine's longer than that. Okay. They finally standardized things a little better than that. It's a little easier to have a standard measurement. But object down in the valley is 300 cubits long. If you use the Egyptian cubit, which is 20.6 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit is 18 inches. Mine is 21 inches. So this is, uh, that's what a cubit is. So if that's Noah's Ark, it certainly is the right size. That makes it about two-thirds as big as the Titanic. So it was a very large boat. Around the ark, around this region down in the valley, they found, I believe, 12 so far of these rocks have been found. These rocks weigh 9,000 pounds, roughly. They are sort of a teardrop shape, almost like they've been shaped for a particular purpose. Um, they have a hole drilled through the top, and the hole is curved. I've drilled a lot of holes. I've built a lot of houses. I don't know how you drill a curved hole through a rock, but they did. Apparently, and by the way, the bigger the rock is, the bigger the hole is. The theory is that it's probably to hold a rope, bigger rock, bigger rope, of course, and the rope was hanging this rock over the side of the boat down into the water. This is called a drogue stone. The purpose of a drogue stone is to keep the boat from shaking around when the waves go by. Shock absorbers. In the, today in the Navy, they have uh, water, I don't, that's not the name for it, they call them drogue chutes, a parachute. If it really gets stormy and the boat's shaking around, you shoot these things down into the water with a chain on them or something, and the parachute, like an umbrella, opens up in the water. And when the boat tries to tip this way, the parachute helps to stop it. It slows it down. So by having a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat would be a nice smooth ride, even though the storm is, you know, moving things around. The other advantage of this is <clears throat> if it really gets windy, the rocks are going to drag behind you because the wind is going to push this boat and it will always turn it perpendicular to the waves. The danger of a boat in, the, in big waves is if the boat is going this way and the wave hits it from the side, it will roll the boat over. This is called capsize, to roll over. When uh, big military ships today get into a storm, they turn the boat and he head into the wind. Because the wind is going to make the waves go a certain direction. You want to be going straight into the wind so the waves can't hit you on the side and knock your boat over. Well, if you had drogue stones, the wind would turn you automatically at a right angle, perpendicular, to the waves. You can't capsize. 
One scoffer said, well, if he, if he had all those rocks hanging all over the boat, uh, wouldn't that slow him down? Uh, he wasn't trying to go anywhere. <laughs> Where was there to go? He's just trying to float, okay? I think if I was Noah, I'd make my ropes long enough to have those rocks touch the bottom. Float up, survive for seven months, float back down. Otherwise, you don't know where you are when you land. Not that it mattered, there's nobody to go visit, but uh, he probably uh, had these rocks long enough. One scoffer I debated said, you can't have a boat that big because when uh, they tried to build a, a boat with six masts, called a six master. If you don't know a sailboat, has the pole sticking up out of it, that's called the mast that holds the sails. Most of the old ships had two or three of these masts, you know, you see these huge poles with all the sails on it. One company, back uh, 1850 or something, tried to build a huge wooden ship, it was 330 feet long I believe, and it had six of these masts sticking up. The reason we have these big trees right around here in Pensacola, the Spanish planted a lot of these trees, they're called live oak, because the wood doesn't rot. Uh, eventually it does, but it's very rot resistant. And it's extremely strong. They keep their leaves all year round. They slowly, you know, they're, ne they're always green. These live oaks are great for building the mast of a ship. Extremely strong, and they would, of course, trim off the branches as they grew and make them grow straight to get uh, a good straight log for the mast of the ship. Well, the scoffer said they built a ship that had six masts, and uh, they took it out in the ocean, and it was just so big when the waves came up, the wave would lift up the middle of the boat and the ends are bending. And it kept bending and bending and bending and pretty soon it started leaking everywhere. And he said, see, you can't build a boat that big. Well, Noah's Ark didn't have any masts, for one. It's not trying to sail. It's just built to float, right? Secondly, God gave him the blueprint. God told him how to build this boat. It was probably reinforced with iron. And the scoffers always assume, of course, there's no iron in this Noah's Ark. And if Noah's Ark had a moon pool, it would solve the problem. I don't know that it had one, but it certainly could have. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls built up inside. <clears throat> and when you go over the wave, the water goes up and down inside that hole. And it does the same thing that a piston does. As it goes up, it push all the air out of the boat, or some of it, just like your lungs do. When the wave goes down, it would be a suction that would suck fresh air in. It would be air circulation. So, we'll have to leave it right there for this week. Next week, we'll talk about what happened to the dinosaurs after the flood. I mean, if this is true, that Noah took dinosaurs on the ark, what happened to them? We'll cover that in the next class. Thank you so much. On creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. We're going to take up where we left off last week. Last week we were talking about Noah's Ark and how dinosaurs had to be on the Ark. So now we're going to cover the question, what happened to the dinosaurs when they got off the Ark? The question of what happened to the dinosaurs has been a source of uh, discussion among groups of people for ever since dinosaurs were discovered. As far as anybody can figure out, the first one, at least in modern times, that was found and reassembled was in 1809, a dentist, or a doctor, I'm sorry, was going, back in those days, doctors made house calls, you know, and they didn't drive Mercedes, but um, not, not that that's good or bad, it's just the fact. And so this uh, doctor was out at a house call, and his wife is standing out there at the carriage waiting for her husband to come out when he's done with taking care of his patient. Well, meanwhile, some guys are fixing a, a drain culvert across. Now, you've got to understand, in the 1800s, there wasn't a lot of heavy construction being done. I mean, nobody was digging huge canals. Nobody was digging giant holes, because whatever you did in the dirt, you did with a shovel and a pick. You know, there weren't any giant machines to do this. So there was very little earth moving going on during the early 1800s. And so when they were digging this little uh, trench to put the uh, uh, drain pipe in or something, fixing some field tile, they, this, these workers discovered some bones, strange bones, especially the big teeth. And so when this doctor came out, uh, the, the wife had been talking to these workers and said, what are these? They said, no, we don't know. We found these here digging in the ditch. And so they, um, they gave them to her, and she showed them to her husband, and he said, he was a doc medical doctor, an intelligent man, and he said, yeah, these, look like, these look exactly like the teeth from an iguana. 
only they're huge. And so they dug around for more and found most of the bones and actually put it together. Now, they put it together wrong, uh, made many mistakes as they reassembled it. If I handed you a pile of bones and said, here, tell me what this is, <laughs> there's no telling what you come up with unless you were really good with anatomy. Uh, so anyway, they put it together. <laughs> they did a pretty good job, but they blew it. And uh, they named it Iguanodon. The word don means teeth, like an orthodontist, okay? Um, they, because it had iguana-shaped teeth. So Iguanodon was actually the first dinosaur in modern times that was reassembled from the bones. Since then, they have found many Iguanodons and put them together and found all the mistakes that they made. For instance, on the original Iguanodon, they found this round, uh, sort of like a snow cone cup, you know, pointed at one end and round at the other end. And um, they said, wow, it was hard. And they said, sharp. They said, it must be a horn on his nose. So they put it on his nose. Later, they found out it was actually his thumb. They'd only found one of them. So, you know, that was one of the many mistakes that were made with the Iguanodon. The point is, it was 1809 when they found these, uh, the first one and reassembled it. For the next 40 years, many dinosaurs were found, and it really became quite a competition among different groups to go out and find these giant creatures. This is 1809. Now, several things are happening in the early 1800s. People are starting to believe the Earth is millions of years old because of the works of some uh, other scientists. Uh, and then you get to 1830, you come to Charles Lyell, who said, who developed our geologic column. So the early 1800s is really where the world lost its uh, biblical basis, and they sacrificed it and accepted evolution teaching, the early stages of evolution. So here they're finding these giant animals, these giant lizards, that nobody has any idea where they fit into history. At the same time, you've got a bunch of people going around teaching a, a false doctrine called the fixidity of the species. They're teaching, well, if there's 14 kinds of finches, then God created 14 kinds of finches, because nothing ever changes. And see, they got off track of what the Bible says. The Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind, and they went beyond the Word of God and said, no, it's only, you know, God made every different species, which is not at all what the Bible says. So here you have a false doctrine being taught by the Christians, uh, a false doctrine being taught by the scientists. They're teaching the earth is millions of years old, and people are starting to believe this. So now in come the dinosaurs. They start finding these giant lizards. It's pretty obvious from the bones that they're finding that they're reptiles and that they're huge. By 1841, they made up a brand new word, dinosaur. Richard Owen made up the word. That'll be a quiz question. You know who invented the word dinosaur and when was it invented? It was 1841. Sir Richard Owen was a very famous scientist in Europe and everybody respected his opinion. And he said, these are giant lizards. And he took a two words, Latin and Greek, and mixed them together. Dinosaur is from two different languages. And so the, our English word uh, com comes from that, dinosaur. Well, right away, people began to guess and speculate, what are these creatures? When did they live? So here you have an ideal time for Satan to come in and start teaching a false idea. Satan, of course, sees all this happening and says, wow, here's my chance to use these creatures, these dinosaurs, to turn people away from God. He knows, of course, the earth is about 6,000 years old, and God certainly knows that, and the Bible certainly teaches that, and everybody believed that in the early 1800s. But now in come the dinosaurs. And so they began arguing about the question, what happened to the dinosaurs? <clears throat> Why did these creatures die? Some people were teaching, well, they drowned in the flood. And uh, may some people started teaching maybe they were wicked, and you know Noah wouldn't allow them on the ark. Now, that would be uh, a false teaching. You know, two of everything went onto the ark. And so it was really a time of turmoil when they didn't quite have enough information to know where they fit into history. They were just kind of recently discovered. The false things were being taught. And so some Christians started accepting and teaching the idea that these dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And so we, we lost the battle in 18, 1840. The battle was lost. People were pretty well convinced, the majority of the population was convinced the earth is millions of years old, and that leaves room for Charles Darwin to come in later and say, well, hey, if the earth is millions of years old, that's, uh, that's time for a lot of changes. And so people readily accepted the evolution idea because they'd already compromised their Bible in some other areas. So what happened to the dinosaurs is a question that kids face all the time in public schools. The textbooks will give the kids some options to choose from. Like, uh, did a meteor strike the Yucatan Peninsula and make the dinosaurs go extinct? That's the most commonly taught theory. If you look at the map of Mexico, at the bottom, 
Around the Gulf of Mexico, it curves back up. It's got that little bump sticking up. That's called the Yucatan Peninsula. It's really not too far from Cuba, where Mexico curls down and comes back up. Uh, right there on the Yucatan Peninsula, they find evidence of a giant meteor strike. Something hit the ground there. A huge meteor hit the ground. And so they threw up some, uh, they say it threw up some iridium, which is a rare element found generally in meteors, and they find this stuff in the drillings in the coast of, uh, off the coast of Florida. So they say, see, this is proof of the meteor strike. Without getting into all the meteor strike arguments, the fact is the Earth is not millions of years old. A meteor probably struck the Earth. That happens all the time. But it doesn't mean it was 65 million years ago. But they will give the kids options. Did the dinosaurs go extinct because of a meteor strike? Or did the mammals start becoming more popular and start eating all the eggs of the dinosaurs and they couldn't survive? You know, but basically, the question is always, what happened to the dinosaurs? Why did they go extinct? Like this textbook says, Dinosaurs lived on the earth for millions of years. Now only their fossils are left. What do you think happened to the dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are extinct. An extinct animal is an animal that no longer lives on earth. So the questions, what made them go extinct, I say is the wrong question. The liberals are really good at getting us to argue about the wrong topic. They ask me all the time, do you think we should have prayer in public schools? You know, should we teach the Bible in public schools? You know, et cetera, et cetera. I say, look, that's a good question, and I'll be glad to talk about it. But there's another question we need to ask first. The real question is, should we have public schools? I mean, that's the real question. If you read uh, your Constitution in the Tenth Amendment, Article 10, also called the Tenth Amendment, says, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are preserved to the states respectively or to the people. What this says is, if this document doesn't spell out, that, if it doesn't say you can do this, then you can't. This was the closing argument to say, whatever you think you have power to do, if it's not spelled out in here, you don't have power to do it. So, no place in the Constitution does it give the federal government the authority to have an education system. The federal government should not be involved in education. They should not be involved in welfare. They shouldn't be involved in an awful lot of things they're involved in. For instance, uh, one of the uh, great statesmen, I believe it was Davy Crockett, I read the story. Uh, Jan, you do a lot of literature, maybe you can find that for me, where Davy Crockett uh, was in Congress, or in the Senate, I forget which he was in, but um, they had a fire and a whole section of the city burned. I think it was Washington, D.C. or one of the suburbs there in Virginia. Massive catastrophe, you know. Back in those days, the houses were built, no fire code, and <laughs> very poor construction, a lot of them, and built real close together. So this fire started, burned the whole city. A lot of people are suffering. No house, you know, no food, no job, etc. Congress voted to take federal funding and come in and rescue these people and give them government aid. Davy Crockett voted for that. And I believe it was Davy Crockett. I may have my name wrong, but it's one of those people like that. Um, later that year, Davy Crockett was out stumping trying to get people to vote for him because the election was coming up. There's this old farmer out there plowing the field with his mule, you know, and Davy Crockett stopped and looked, leaned over the fence, and the farmer finally stopped his mule and came over and said, uh, Sir, I'm Mr. Crockett, and I'm in Congress. I'd like you to vote for me to re-election. farmer said, Nope, can't do it. Can't vote for you again, ever. He said, I voted for you last time. I thought you were a good man, but I can't vote for you. He said, Well, well why not? He said, Because uh, you voted to give those folks uh, federal money for rebuilding their houses. He said, well, man, there was a whole city burned and they were all suffering. And the farmer said, well, you only did that because you live near these folks and you know about them. What about the people in, uh, you know, 500 miles away that are having, there's catastrophes all the time. Mr. Crockett, you have violated my trust because that money was not your money to spend. That money was my money and everybody else's money delegated to you to spend according to the Constitution. And he gave Davy Crockett a lesson on the Tenth Amendment that the federal government has no business being involved in welfare. This man said, if that city burned and those people were needing some money, every one of you congressmen should have reached in your pocket and taken your money out and given it to them. You have no authority to spend that money, that federal money, on your pet projects because you think it's important. And Davy Crockett said, sir, I am sorry, I promise I will never do that again. And he talked to the farmer for a while and finally the farmer said, okay, well, I'll, everybody makes a mistake once. I'll let it go this time. But rest assured, if you do this, something like this again, I will not only not vote for you, I will campaign against you. 
And if we had a bunch of folks that were that smart in our country that realized our government is spending money on things they have no business spending money on. Now, when you mention this, that we shouldn't even have a public school system, people will come back and say, well, don't you think kids need an education? Oh, that's not the question. Of course kids need an education. Of course kids need to learn. Of course we need to have schools. But should the government be involved is the question. And if they don't like what the Constitution says, they should lobby to change the Constitution. They shouldn't just ignore it and go around it. So, back to the dinosaurs. What happened to them? Well, before we get there, you might want to find out this article on why the schools went public. I would recommend you get on the website exodus2000.org. Uh, Ray, Ray Moore Jr. is a friend of mine. Just has a tremendous, tremendous information on what's happening in our schools and how that it's really part of a larger plan toward a new world order. Exodus2000.org. Eagle Forum also has a good website, eagleforum.org, uh, I believe, or .com. That's Phyllis Schlafly's organization in Alton, Illinois, by St. Louis. So that'd be some good information if you want to go off and chase that rabbit tail. You can get also, also get uh, Blumenfeld's, uh, uh, Samuel Blumenfeld has great, great information on this topic, as does Reasons Foundation. They're just Many people, this, this is a topic I love to read about. I don't have time to chase that rabbit too far down the hole. But the public schools are part of a long-range plan. It's actually Karl Marx's idea, free public education. That's a vital step in the advancement of communism. And we'll get into that much later on uh, seminar part five. Okay, what happened to the dinosaurs? Before the flood, we have a world where people are living 900 years. Beautiful climate, canopy of water probably overhead, increasing air pressure, no, gen no genetic load or very little genetic deformities because, you know, the race is still pure and no, nothing has entered in that would cause those things. Now we have a flood that destroys all that. So after the flood, we notice a very different world. The time before the flood, people are living 900 years. After the flood, it drops off to 400 right away. Noah's son, Shem, only lived to be 600 years old, which is really pretty incredible when you consider the average age is 912 before the flood. His life is one-third shorter than the average of everybody that came before him. That's like if the average age today is uh, 70, and somebody only lives to be, um, what would one third of that be, um, 45 or so, we'd say, boy, he died young, didn't he? Everybody thought, wow, Shem died awful young. Of course, Noah didn't live to see that. And then Shem's son, Arphaxad, only lived to be 438 years. Actually, Shem outlived Arphaxad. I've wondered about that. You know, why did Shem live longer than his sons and his great grandson and almost longer than his great grandson? Well, possibly Shem, during his formative years, the first hundred years of his life, he was in the pre flood environment. So he would have had a very different uh, uh, stamina. Yeah, his physical abilities were probably much greater. Because, just like if a, if a child is, is raised in a, a poor environment and have poor nutrition, uh, they're likely to be stunted for life, mentally or physically or both. If you don't give a kid, even during the prenatal, before they're born, if a mother does things, you know, smokes or drinks or whatever, just deprives the child of oxygen, it can affect that kid for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah short, right? Because Vietnam, poor food, or minim, not enough food. Okay. Average height in America now is much higher than it was, you know, 100 years ago. We're getting, it's easier to get food more steroids and pesticides, or no, you know, steroids in the beef and stuff we eat, so causing all sorts of trouble. Anyway, lifespan dropped off to 400 years for a few generations. Then it dropped off to 200. Now there's probably a, a couple of reasons why it dropped off again in the days of Peleg. Uh, we get into that, the days of Peleg, we'll get into that later um, in video number six, so seminar part six. It'll probably be four years till we get there in our class at the rate we're going. But why did it drop off again? But then, after a couple generations of 200 years old, you come to a fellow named, uh, to Abraham's father, actually, Terah, who lived to be 205. Then it dropped below 200. Abraham was 175. And when you read that, that sounds really old. But if you look at his ancestors, that's nothing. Just about everybody's living longer than that. So it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. It got down to probably 70 or 80 years average lifespan for quite a while. There were people in Bible times that lived to be over a hundred. There were people in Bible times that were six foot six. 
you know. Abe Lincoln was six foot six. But the average height of the people during, you know, 100 years ago was shorter. There were still people that were eight feet tall, you know. Um, so things are dropping off. During the Dark Ages, it really dropped off when we had, you know, knowledge suppressed by the Catholic Church, you know. And so there's about a thousand year span in here where information is suppressed in order to keep people dumb and keep people enslaved to, you know, the church dogma. Then in the last 500 years, we've seen an Im improvement in a lot of medical fields and things like that, diet diets and sanitation. A lot of sanitary laws, I think. And we've got a videotape called The Bible and Health that'll give you a ton of information on, you know, God's plan for what the scripture says about health. Sanitary laws, dietary laws, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the same thing that happened to the people, their lifespans are being shortened after the flood. That's also happening to the animals. Reptiles that lived before the flood and got to be 80 feet long now simply can't live as long. And therefore they can't grow as big. And therefore some of them even might die before they reach maturity to have kids of their own. And so the whole species goes extinct. You mentioned about the uh, panthers and stuff probably going to go extinct, you know, if the, or the cougars or even the uh, um, cheetahs. Just, there just aren't enough of them. You know, the gene pool is too limited and they're probably, the panda bear is probably going to go extinct. It's just, uh, it's probably a genetic uh, deformity or a, a mutation from the original bear. And they're pretty and they're cute, but they're just not going to make it. Okay? If you left the chihuahuas in, in the world all alone, leave them all alone, put them out in the woods, <laughs> they wouldn't make it. They just, it's a, it's a useless dog, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so here we have a time after the flood when lifespans are dropping off, and so people are killing the dinosaurs. In addition to them dying from the climate, they've also got people going against them. I think they killed them for several reasons. They killed them for meat. There would be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them because they were a menace. You know, nobody wants to live next door to a dinosaur. They killed them to be a hero. I saved the village, you know, I slew the dragon. They killed him to prove his superiority or competition for land or medicine, med med medicinal purposes. All kinds of ancient recipes call for dragon bones or dragon saliva or dragon fat. I mean, here you're reading this, what would appear to be a normal recipe. You know, you mix this and this and this and, you know, a little bit of dragon fat. And <laughs> It's not like they're trying to exaggerate. It's just like, hey, it's just normal. You're supposed to put that in there. You know, everybody does. You know, don't you know? <laughs> kind of stuff. So... Especially if somebody gets the idea that, you know, if you, uh, if you mix dragon bones in your soup, it'll do something special for you, you know. Then people are going to go out and hunt the dragons just to kill them for their, their body parts. Just like the rhinoceros. You know, the poor rhinoceros has this, you know, like a fingernail uh, horn on his nose that's made of the same material, keratin. Well, some guys in some of these countries get the, get the dumb idea that, you know, if you make a knife and the handle is made out of a rhinoceros horn, you will be invincible. Nobody will be able to beat you in battle. Well, of course, we know that's not true, but it is kind of hard on the rhinoceros. And so that's probably what happened to the dragons. People were killing them off for all sorts of reasons. The Bible mentions dragons quite a few times. Uh, Thirty-five times, actually, dragons are mentioned in the Bible. That'd be a good quiz question. How many times are dragons mentioned in the Bible? You have to understand, the King James Version would not mention dinosaurs. Who can tell me why the King James Version would not mention dinosaurs? The name dinosaur hadn't been invented yet. King James Version translated in 1611, the word dinosaur made up in 1841. Obviously, they're not going to use a word that hasn't been invented yet. So they used the word dragons, which was used all through history. They're called dragons. And there are many books written about this, and literally thousands of legends of people talking about seeing dragons, or killing dragons, or somebody being killed by a dragon. The word dinosaur made up in 1841 by Richard Owen. Up until that time, they're known as dragons. Now, after the flood, you got eight people. Everybody, you know, spreads out around the world in the next few hundred years. They have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, and pretty soon you start to get a good-sized population. And they're spreading out, taking over new territory, you know, civilizing the world. <clears throat> However, <laughs> whatever you think of that, that's what they did. As they spread out, the population begins to grow. Big, ferocious animals are going to be killed off. How many grizzly bears here in Escambia County, Pensacola, Florida, roam in the woods? None. Right. How many were there 500 years ago, you think? Probably lots of them. Well, what happened? When the more people move into an area, the more the big ferocious animals just aren't welcome. 
they're going to be driven off or they're going to be killed off. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Pensacola, Florida, what would happen by six in the morning? Every redneck in the country would be out there with his rifle trying to shoot one, right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would have his picture in the paper the next morning holding it up by the tail, you know, I shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. Right? Now, nothing has changed. Okay? People are still the same. They were looking to kill these dragons for all these reasons, because they were a menace, um, to be a hero. If you, uh, you, you go deer hunting at all? I ask the deer hunters, you know, those poor guys go out and try to shoot Bambi's daddy all the time. Um, I say, if you're up in your tree stand and five bucks come running through the woods, you only have time to get off one shot. <clears throat> Which one are you going to shoot at? The largest one, the biggest one, okay? Well, if you have this same mentality back 4,000 years ago and there's dragons out there to hunt, which one are you going to go for? The biggest one. Actually, they find now with satellite images, it's pretty interesting. I need to get a slide of this. There are, you know what a key, keyhole looks like? The old-fashioned keyhole, it's round on top and then two V's coming down like this. The old-fashioned skeleton key would go in a keyhole. A uh, round circle with a triangle at the bottom. From satellites, they've noticed all over Europe and America, it, it appears to be thousands of years old, where somebody had built a giant keyhole shape, like a funnel that would, you could herd all, chase a bunch of animals, they'd hit this funnel and they'd end up in this, in this circle, a corral. You, uh, you chase them into this keyhole, bottom part of the keyhole, and they end up going in the circle. Only these things are two miles long, these keyholes. You can't even see them tear up in a satellite. You know, and you see the, they're picking these things out. A lot of research been done uh, by this on this topic by uh, William Corliss at uh, the Source Book Project. It's called fascinating stuff. He has um, shows shows some of the pictures and drawings of these things. The theory is that people were using these to chase. You know, when they want to civilize an area to take over a new area for you know build your city, they go in there and they chase all the dragons or whatever into this area using torches or you know something that makes noise or fly, flames or something. And they end up trapped in here, and then you slaughter them, because you surround them. You pen them in. Now they're easier to hunt, like shooting fish in a barrel. So I think after the flood, people are killing these dragons. And there are literally thousands of legends of people killing dragons. If you want to read some amazing stories, I'd recommend you read, like, for instance, the Gilgamesh epic about Gilgamesh, who slew a dragon. We have a book that we offer here called The Great Dinosaur Mystery uh, by Paul Taylor. Let's see. We're in our office now. The book is here someplace, but great book talking about dragons all through history. There's a Chinese legend. Um, oh, you were in China for a while, Jan? Or? Chinese legend says a famous uh, man named Yu, after the Great Flood, Yu surveyed the land of China and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off into the sea and make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. You're reading this Chinese story, and it's, uh, you know, we've got to build the channels to get rid of the water. We, you know, it's all swampy. We've got to, you know, drain the land so we can build our cities. And by the way, we had to drive out the dragons. And, you know, just like it's normal. Everybody has to do that, you know. Nobody thought anything about it. This is from uh, Wycliffe, Bible, Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia. This is the god Marduk. Now, the Babylonians had all sorts of gods. One of their gods was Marduk. Here's Marduk shown pictured sitting on top of a fire-breathing dragon. Notice the flame coming out of his mouth. Fire-breathing dragon. Now, there's lots of legends about dragons, but there are also an awful lot of legends about fire-breathing dragons. So where would this fit in? In the book of Isaiah, it talks about a fiery flying serpent. Hmm. In the book of Job, it talks about... Uh, in Job chapter 41, it's got an entire chapter about an animal called Leviathan. And it says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. You might want to watch our videotape, the green one over there with the L on it, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. Um, in Job 41, it says this, uh, about this Leviathan, out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches between Sunday school and church. Uh, it says, out of a seething potter cauldron, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. 
The Bible certainly teaches there was a fire-breathing dragon. There's certainly a lot of history about fire-breathing dragons. It is chemically possible to do that. Uh, and we've got an animal today called bombardier beetle that does a similar thing. It sprays out two chemicals and burns his enemies. They're here in Florida. They call them the blister bug, the bombardier beetle. We cover all that on video about Leviathan. Anyway, if you get a Catholic Bible, the Catholic Bible has seven extra books, and a few of the books have extra chapters. For instance, the book of Daniel in our Bible has 12 chapters. In the book of Daniel in the Catholic Bible, it has 14 chapters. One is about Susan, or Susanna, uh, and chapter 13 is, and then chapter 14 is about the dragon. This chapter is known as Bell and the Dragon. Fascinating reading. Okay, I don't think it should be part of Scripture, but here's the way the story goes. Catholic Bible, Daniel 14, 22. And there was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, O king. That's an old English phrase that means you give me permission. I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. In other words, I'd like to see how you're going to do this. How, are you, how would you kill this dragon? without a sword or a club. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder." Very strange story. Here's the Hoven translation of what's going on. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 1 that Daniel was one of those who was skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science. Well, I would assume that Daniel probably knew that nearly all animals like things that taste salty. You put a salt block out in the woods and the deer come up, the cows come up, everything comes to lick the salt. Daniel took pitch and fat and hair. Well, pitch is sticky, made from tree sap. You take pine tree sap and boil it down and make pitch. There were whole industries used to make pitch just to cover the ships back 200 years ago before they discovered oil. First really commercial oil well was in Pennsylvania, Becky, in 1828, I believe. Uh, so before that time, they, had, they still had to make their ships waterproof, and they would use pitch, where they boil down the sap of these trees. Daniel took pitch, which is sticky, and fat, which tastes salty, and hair, which won't digest. You ever see a cat or a dog cough up when they get a hairball? You know, <laughs> cough up this hairball. Um, hair won't digest. So Daniel took these three, boiled them together, made lumps, gave them to the dragon, and the dragon burst asunder. Hoven translation is, Daniel tossed these things in the cage. The dragon ate them up because they tasted good. They wouldn't digest because of the hair. They stuck in his intestinal tract. And this was the ultimate case of, case of uh, dragon constipation. And the dragon burst asunder. Those were the days before Roto-Rooter. And so <laughs> it blew him up. What a way to go, huh? But it's just an interesting story in the Catholic Bible about uh, dragon. Yeah, they blow up. You feed them too much, they founder, right? Yeah. Saddam Insane, uh, Hussein, um, Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He has huge pictures of himself all over the countryside. He has his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency. He claims that he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. Now, his name is Saddam Hussein. Saddam means, uh, Saddam means prince. George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. You go back and listen to the news reels, you know, George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. Oh, this was done very intentionally. It wasn't that George Bush is stupid and didn't know, you know how to pronounce his name. The word Saddam is the Arabic word that means horse's rear end. So George Bush was intentionally, intentionally calling him horse's rear end, Saddam Hussein. Interesting bit of trivia. Anyway, we'll take a break here in a second, but Saddam... In order to fulfill the image that he is Nebuchadnezzar, he has spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Babylon was destroyed about 600 B.C. by the Medes and the Persians, 586 or whenever it was. The Medes and the Persians came in there, destroyed Babylon, okay, wiped it out, burned the city, etc., etc. Um, took Daniel captive. And the book of Daniel is interesting because Daniel starts off in Israel. He's taken a slave, made a eunuch, takes him over to uh, Babylon. He lives there for a while. Then they, they fall, and he goes into Media Persia and becomes, you know, one of their high people there. By that time, he's uh, 
you know, an old man, like 90 years old, and he still becomes one of the, the good guys, and they, that's when they throw him in the lion's den. He's like 90 years, you don't want to be thrown anywhere when you're 90. You certainly don't, don't want to be thrown into a den of lions. I should say den of lions, not lion's den, because a lion's den can be the place where they live, but nobody's there. A den of lions means they're there, right? He wasn't thrown into the lion's den, he was thrown into the den of lions, which in the Bible is very clear to spell that out in the King James Version. So, Saddam decided to rebuild the ancient city. It was destroyed about 600 B.C. They've always known where it was, it was just a ruins. You know, the Middle East is full of those ruins, you know. Egypt, about all they can do is point to their glorious past. You know, look at these big, huge buildings we used to have around here. Everything's destroyed now. But it sat desolate, destroyed for quite a while. Saddam decided to rebuild the old city. Well, most of the city walls had been preserved. It's a real sandy, you know, desert area. The wind blew all the sand in and covered them up and preserved them. They're just buried in sand. So they excavated down, found the old walls of the city that were really well preserved. The brick was, and it contained hundreds of pictures of dragons on the sides of the city walls. Now look at this dragon. This one, they took the bricks apart and reassembled it back in Berlin. But uh, however you pronounce the name of that museum. Strange animal. It has scales all over its body. See the scales on its neck and on its tail? On the feet, it has like claws. <clears throat> now, and a, a forked tongue. That would indicate a reptile. And a horn on his head. All over these walls, and they've rebuilt the walls. In other words, they've rebuilt a whole section in, in a, a museum in Berlin. They have these pictures of dragons and lions. Apparently, in 600 B.C., they really did have a dragon in captivity in Babylon. And the Catholic Bible chapter about this may be, you know, based on historical fact that there were dragons still alive in 600 B.C. Now, this had been 1,800 years since the flood, so probably the majority were dead, and it was a rare thing to have a dragon. Certainly, it would be a rare thing to have a dragon in your castle. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar and his, all of his superstition thought this was some kind of god because it obviously was a big, ferocious beast and everybody should worship it. Of course, he built a big gold statue and said everybody should worship that, you know, and he had a hard time worshiping stuff that he shouldn't have worshipped. So here we have an interesting story about dragons from 600 B.C. Uh, dinosaurs, I think, lived after the flood, becoming more rare, becoming smaller, less numerous, uh, more rare, driven out of certain areas totally. Extinct. Some species probably went extinct. By 300 B.C., they were very rare. Alexander the Great, though, reported dragons when he conquered part of India. We'll take a little break. When we come back, we'll uh, talk more about dragons that are mentioned through history and then eventually lead up into dinosaurs that are still alive today and dinosaurs that are mentioned in the Bible. We'll cover all that after the break. Okay, let's go through a few more uh, reports from ancient history 2,000 years ago or so about dragons. Alexander the Great... Um, <clears throat> conquered part of India. As he was conquering the parts of the, the cities over there in this region, the people begged him not to kill the dragons that were sacred to them. And he said, what, what dragons? He said, oh, outside the city in the caves, there are dragons and we take sacrifices out to them. Alexander reported that, uh, you know, he said, I told him I wouldn't kill them, but I would like to see them. When he went out to see the dragons, the dragons stuck their heads out and hissed at his soldiers and scared him half to death. That's in, I don't know if it's in his diary or what, the records of Alexander the Great. Uh, this Roman mosaic, made out of small pieces of tile, you know, stuck together, was made about the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting. Or necking. Can't tell what's happening for sure. Man, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Uh, anyway, how on, earth, how on earth would the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? Now here you got these modern scholars saying, you know, nobody's ever seen a dinosaur because they lived millions of years ago. Well, how did they depict them on their pottery then? Uh, St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. He was later martyred for his faith. He's the patron saint of England and Portugal. Uh, St. George and the dragon. This would have been in the first couple centuries after Christ. If you ever try to read the old Beowulf story, I've got the story in, in uh, my library there. Old English Beowulf is extremely difficult to read. I mean, you can only understand a few of the words, okay? Because English has changed so much since 583 A.D. But the Beowulf story is interesting. I've read it several times. He killed Grendel the dragon 
by pulling off his arm. The story says Beowulf grabbed Grendel the dragon and pulled off one of his arms, and the creature fled out of the room and then later bled to death. Well, most anybody that studies a T-Rex will tell you, even though he had ferocious head and ferocious teeth and was, you know, huge, his front arms are pretty tiny. And if you could ever get a hold of one, you probably could jerk it right off. Hmm. We found an ancient Babylonian cylinder seal. This is from the book by Bill Cooper, After the Flood, a tremendous book. He traces the history of what happened to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Where did their kids go? You know? And has found some amazing records, done great research. Now, Bill Cooper is a very sick man. He lives in England, but he's, uh, I believe, dying of cancer. Last report I got. But this picture is from his book about a Babylonian cylinder seal. It would have been about 600 B.C. Again, it shows a man pulling the arm off of a dragon. What a way to fight a dragon. Grab his arms. Uh, pictures from all over the world, ancient legends, ancient pottery, shows dinosaurs on it. Here's from the book The Ancient Near East in Pictures. Uh, shows a picture of two long neck animals. I would say a dinosaur they're trying to depict here without much question. This uh, another piece of ancient pottery shows two long necked dragons and they're holding a sheep. Now, if dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, like the textbook says, how did these people know to depict them on their pottery? Here's a hippo tusk made of ivory uh, that was carved to be a magic wand or whatever for an Egyptian grave, found from a 12th century BC tomb. 1,200 years before Christ, it's even before King Solomon, um, chose an animal with a long neck and a long tail. The giraffe has a long neck, does not have a long tail. The only animal I know that has a long neck and a long tail is a dinosaur. There are stories and legends from countries all over the world. I, I, every place I travel, I see stuff like this, so I grab my camera and get a picture, you know. Uh, Thai seafood restaurant showing the head of a dragon on their boat. Now, why would they build boats with dragon heads on them? There's a Russian medallion showing a man slaying a dragon. A Bulgarian postage stamp has a guy slaying a dragon. Irish writer in 900 AD reported that somebody killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Probably the Stegosaurus, although several dinosaurs had these big spikes on their tail. There are several websites about dragons. I don't, none of them that I'm aware of, I haven't, didn't read through all of them, but they're all uh, secular. They're not at all Christian that I could see. But they do keep um, interesting articles about dragon stories from ancient literature. So if you want to get into the study of dragons, it's really pretty interesting to see all about the dragons. The Viking ships had these dragon heads on them. If you study Scandinavian literature, you can see the dragon head on this one. <coughs> Ancient Scandinavian literature has an awful lot of stories about the kraken or the giant dragons of the sea. We well, figure that the Vikings are the guys that are going around the ocean in their boats, you know, conquering villages. Where's the hardest place to exterminate an animal totally? In the water, in the water. yeah. Especially the ocean. <laughs> on land, you could eventually corner it, figure out some way to get it, but on the ocean, you'd have a tough time. And so there are th this is from 1000 A.D. Here we have evidence of dragons living with man just 1,000 years ago. In the book called The Unexplained, um, there's information about this. There's also uh, an account of a dragon called Nithhogger that the Vikings was killed in the book After the Flood by uh, William Cooper, Bill Cooper. According to the Norse legend, Siegfried slew the dragon Fafner that was... The dragon had made its home in a cave, and somebody else had buried a treasure in that cave. I'm sure the dragon didn't know that and didn't care, but the people wanted the treasure, of course, so you got to kill the dragon to get to it. Several, there are several different stories about the, how Siegfried, Siegfried slew the dragon. Um, of course, you know, legends get twisted with time. One story says he dug a pit because they knew the only soft part of, of the dragon was his belly. So he dug a pit and laid in this pit until the dragon went over him, and then he jabbed his sword up into the dragon's belly. That's one story. Another one is he just charged up there and just stabbed it in the heart, you know. Who knows how it really happened. 
But Carl Schuker is a scientist in England, has a great book called Dragons, A Natural History. I've got it in my library. Just story after story of people slaying dragons down to history. Marco Polo reported in his memoirs, when he came back from China, he said, the emperor in China raises dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Ceremonial dragons. Well, all you have to do is go to any Chinese restaurant and you'll see dragons all over the place. It's just a part of their culture. Over in China, you probably saw them all over, didn't you? In China, the dragon represents the king, and it's very good. Interesting. Well, why on earth would Marco Polo come back and say, the emperor is raising dragons to pull, pull chariots in his parades? I think it's probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. <laughs> Marco Polo was an extremely famous man. Well, he wouldn't want to do something dumb and jeopardize his reputation, I don't think, anyway. Uh, the city in France was renamed Nurluk in honor of the man who slew the dragon in the city. I think if we actually could get an unperverted view of history, we would see there's an awful lot of legends that are based on some kind of real story. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you will find carvings on the walls of the Grand Canyon. The Indians did this all over. They call them pictograph, including a picture of a dinosaur. If you look at dinosaurs, many of them had the upright posture, we call that. They walk on two legs, and the front two legs, we assume, were, you know, held up off the ground, similar to an ostrich, I guess, uh, upright posture. Though there are some animals, like frogs, that walk on four legs. The front two are real tiny, the back two are really big. So the size of the leg doesn't mean he didn't walk on it, necessarily. But why would they carve dragons on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Here's another one with a round body, four legs, long neck, long tail. Dr. Delancey was a dentist in Pennsylvania um, who took these pictures. His wife, Margaret Delancey, um, his widow, she uh, lives in Percocet, Pennsylvania. Right? I've preached up in that city four or five times, right near there, Sellersville and up just north of Philadelphia. That's south, you're from Allentown though, right? Up yeah. South of Scranton, yeah. Um, he's the one who took these pictures and she let me use these. Uh, in the Aboriginal caves in Australia, there are many legends of dragons from caves in Australia. This was just sent to me. Agawa Rock Art from however you pronounce that, uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. Notice the outline of the dragon with the bumps on his back. This is called cliff art, rock art. There's another name for this. Uh, some people call it oop art. That'd be a good quiz question. OOP means out of place. Out of place artifacts. And so they get the name Oop Art. Um, that's just a slogan that people use. So if you find something that shouldn't be there, if you're digging down in the ground and you're down in area where it should be from, you know, 500 years ago from some Indian civilization, and you find an Evinrude outboard motor, that would be an out of place artifact, right? That shouldn't be there. So oop art is out of place artifacts, things that really shouldn't be there. This type of stuff is by the evolutionist, a person who believes in evolution, often will classify this kind of material as, oh, we don't understand it, it's an enigma, you know, forget it. I've got whole books of these enigmas that they can't explain. Down in Lima, Peru, if you go south about eight hours drive through the mountains, you come to the city of Ica. Ica, Peru is right near the desert that is the driest desert in the world. My understanding is it's only rained once there in 400 years. Not a good place for a uh, uh, garden. But the Spanish came through this area about 400 years ago in the late 1500s. They came through and they saw these strange white lines. Not very wide, but there were these white lines. Just somebody scratched like a plow on a field. Perfectly straight lines, you know, for a long ways. Nobody knew what they were until airplanes were invented. When you get way up in the sky, you notice these are pictures of giant images. You ever heard of those before, the Nazca Desert lines, you know? Um, they have you know, spiders and hummingbirds, and I mean, four or five miles long. Sometimes they go right, you come to a mountain, it stops, you go on the other side of the mountain, and it takes off in an exact straight line. 
So these guys really knew something about surveying and mathematics to be able to do this. Or, there's another reasonable theory, I think, they had flight. They knew how to fly. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Here's people after the flood living to be 400 years. You could learn a lot in 400 years. People before the flood are 900 years old. You could really learn a lot in 900 years. Plus, you can go talk to your great, 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 great grandfather because he's still alive. You can get all this. The wisdom would be incredible, the knowledge that was preserved. In the uh, Smithsonian, they have, and I'll show you when I get to video number uh, seven, our question and answer, we've got a whole section on was ancient man primitive. We have a book, as a matter of fact, on that topic here that we sell. Or here we do sell the bl uh, book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. I didn't, I didn't, forgot about that. We just started carrying that. The Puzzle of Ancient Man is a great book which shows, for instance, uh, pictures of things that are found in graves that just shouldn't be there. Like a grave in uh, South America, they found an airplane. This grave was at least a thousand years old. An airplane, a little toy airplane. So Smithsonian has it, and they have it labeled as a stylized insect. Tell me that's a stylized insect. In 1571, the Spanish reported finding stones with strange animals carved on them. Now, who remembers roughly when were dinosaurs uh, rediscovered in modern times? The first one was reassembled, the bones put together when? 1809. 1571. By 1571, most dinosaurs were extinct, been killed off by man. They had not been rediscovered yet to put them together in museums. So we have a several hundred year time lag in here where nobody knew about dinosaurs. Never heard of them. Never saw one. But the Spanish said these stones had strange animals carved on them. They didn't know what they were. They just reported it. You know, we went across this desert and found strange carvings. Today they are known as the Nazca burial stones from the Nazca Desert. They were probably built about the time of Christ, roughly 500 B.C. to 500 A.D. These stones are a little smaller than a football, though they range from, you know, golf ball size to the size of a lazy boy chair. The average is about the size of a football or less. Here's Dr. Dakara, a medical doctor from Lima, Peru, who collects the stones. He has 11,000 of them in his collection. These stones have dinosaurs on them. Now, it's interesting, if you really study this topic, and I've re I read Dr. Dakar's book, and I've t I know several folks who've been down there many times to study this. I could get one of the stones for 2,000 bucks if I want to spend 2,000 on one, get one of these little Ica stones. I've held them in my hand. Um, it's just an amazing story about these, these stones. This one, for instance, uh, over 50,000 have been found in Ica. This one shows a Triceratops. Behind him is a Stegosaurus. In front of him is an Ankylosaurus, probably. Off to the left is a an Apatosaurus, long neck, and a T-Rex of some kind. Notice on the sides of this, this one, you see the circles in the skin? Hmm. Keep that thought in mind. Here's a guy hitting one on the head with something. Dr. Baugh is a friend of mine from Glen Rose, Texas. He has two of the stones. If you're driving across and stop at the museum, you can see his Ica stones that he has there. He went down there and was able, because he's a museum, they do a museum to museum transfer. You're not allowed to sell Peruvian treasures or you'll, be, uh, you'll go to jail. Now, because of this, the people who are finding these stones have to be very careful what they do. Don Patton lives in Garland, Texas. He has one of the stones. You can see some good pictures on them on the website Bible.ca, which stands for Canada, uh, slash tracks. Is the, now, I don't agree with some of the stuff on Bible.ca, but all, they do have a lot of interesting material on there uh, on this website. Um, Anton Ouellette is a friend of mine from Canada. He speaks French. He went and Spanish and English. He went down there and spent eight months studying the Ica stones. He gave me the book about the Ica stones that I have and uh, pictures, the pictures that he took of these Ica stones. There's his phone number if you want to call him up, 450-359-4405. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Dennis Swift is a pastor in Oregon. I preached at his church at a large Nazarene church there in Beaverton, Oregon. That's about 2,500 people. He um, collects the stones also. He goes down there twice a year to study this topic and brings back the stones if he can. Here's, again, notice the circles on the side of the dinosaur. It's kind of strange. 
Here's then a swift holding, one with the triceratops on it. The carvings in these stones are pretty amazing. They all, they all have a coating on them that comes with time. It's called oxidation. Almost all materials, or many materials, if they're exposed to the air, they oxidize. You know, your car starts off bright, shiny paint. After 10 years, if you don't do anything, it'll oxidize and the paint fades. The oxygen actually, you know, gets into the paint and oxidizes it. Well, that's what happens to these stones also. So they analyzed these stones and said that the coating on there, the oxidized coating, would require several hundred years to accumulate that much. So if somebody comes along and says, well, these stones are fake, somebody made them last week. We have several things to prove that that is not true. Number one, the oxidized coating on there says they're at least several hundred years old. Number two, the Spanish reported them 400 years ago, before dinosaurs were even a, a, a popular idea. Number three, this circle on the side is interesting. Now, dinosaur bones have been found for the last few hundred years and reassembled. Nobody had ever found dinosaur skin. Dinosaurs sk skinned would not fossilize very easily. A few times, skin impressions were found where apparently the dinosaur fell down in the mud. He rotted away, but the mud hardened, and it left behind an impression of his skin, and you can see they did have scales. In 1992, I believe, a Bolivian missionary found fossilized dinosaur skin. This is from Dr. Baugh's museum. Again, on the dinosaur on the left, you can notice the circles on the side. They've discovered now that dinosaur skin has rosetta patterns, they're called, circles. Now, if the skin wasn't discovered till 1992, but the stones were discovered in 1940s, basically. The Spanish knew about them, but in 1946, they really became popular. People started going after these things. How would they know to put the circles on the side if you're carving them? You would not know to put those circles on the side of the dinosaur because you didn't know dinosaurs had circles in their skin because no skin had ever been found until 1992. Interesting. Now, because it is illegal to sell Peruvian treasure, they sent, because, and because of this, all the information about these stones, somebody, I think it was NOVA or some science program, sent somebody down there to Peru to investigate. They got down there and they got this, one of the farmers who has produced most of the stones, and he won't tell anybody where he gets them because he's out, he's out robbing these graves. That's what he's doing, these old graves. Um, and he sells these stones to tourists or to Dr. Dakara, who buys as many as he can afford. Um, they got this guy on camera and asked him, where do you get these stones? Now understand, if you are getting Peruvian treasures, you know, ancient artifacts, and selling them, you go to jail. They say in Peru, a jail sentence is like a death sentence. Because they're just, I mean, you think Mexican jails are bad. They say Peruvian jails are the worst there are. For one thing, they, they throw you in jail and lock you up. They don't feed you. They don't entertain you. They do nothing for you. If your family on the outside doesn't bring you some food, you will starve to death. Average life expectancy in a Peruvian jail is about two years, is what I've been told. So, here's the camera videotaping this Mexican farmer, or this Peruvian farmer, and they're asking him the question, where do you get these stones? Right behind the camera are two Peruvian police officers. In case he says, I'm digging them up out of a grave and I'm selling them. He's going to go to jail. So the guy stands there in front of the camera and says, oh, I make these stones. It's a hobby of mine. So they say, gave him one of the stones that had no markings on it, gave him the same kind of rock, and said, here, make one for us. So he carved one out with a, with a you know, scratched the, the surface like that, and it was lousy. Nothing similar at all to what he had here. But the scientists came home and said, see, they're there saying there's dinosaurs lived with humans. You know, we know it's not true. Just Peruvian farmers making these things. It's all a big hoax. And that story is still reported today among the evolutionist circles because they got this one report where somebody went down there and investigated it. Well, it was just simply silly the way that was done. They have the oxidized coating. They had circles in the skin. They can't make them like this. Nobody's been able to now, anyway. 
the simple fact is they're trying to cover up for the obvious. They don't want to admit that maybe man and dinosaurs live together. Um, Dennis Swift here is holding one. Again, you see the circles on the side of the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, probably. Here's a guy cutting the head off of one. Uh, obviously, I would think a dinosaur-like creature. Here's a guy riding one. Some have suggested that maybe dinosaurs were used to help build some of the giant buildings, like the Great Pyramid, or the huge stones found up in Peru in the mountains that weigh 20,000 tons. Well, the biggest crane on Earth today can only lift 3,000 tons. There's a picture in there of a hundred thousand, I mean, of a, of a hundred ton rock in that book, uh, The Ancient Puzzle of Ancient Man. These are up on the top of mountains. And they're cut and they fit together with a you know, part of a wall. How do you move a hundred ton stone? Well, some have suggested maybe dinosaurs were involved. In a city called Acumbaro, Mexico, if you look at Mexico City on a map, and go west about an hour, you come to the city of Acumbaro. Um, John Turney, I've talked to him on the phone, never met him yet, he's in Connecticut. He's been there many times to study the similar stones that are found in Acumbaro, Mexico. Down there, this stones with dinosaurs and humans on them, it's kind of a cult. The, they're, they're guarded. It's kind of a secret. They don't want people knowing about this. But at least 56,000 of these stones have been found, and they're locked away in a big museum. John Turney's been in to see them and photographed them. Uh, again, you find dinosaurs and humans together in Acumbaro, Mexico. Now, first place, who on earth would sit around and carve 56,000 stones? Why? If you're just going to lock them up in a museum, what's your motive? Um, I think we have evidence, very strong evidence, of man and dinosaurs living together. In 1572, an Italian peasant killed a dragon. The story goes that he was walking his cows, the small dragon came out and hissed at his cows and scared them, so he smacked it on the head and broke its neck, killed the dragon. They got the local guy in town who was interested in scientific type stuff, a local scientist named Ulysses Aldrovandus, an Italian scientist, who got the dead body of this dragon and had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display. Now, it wasn't the bones, it was the skin, stuffed by a taxidermist in 1572. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona, in an old grave. Now, you've got to understand, the Roman Empire was, you know, around the time of Christ. Kind of petered out about 300 years after Christ, and the political Roman Empire switched hats and became the holy, uh, Catholic, unholy Roman Catholic Church. And so it's really continuing the same era, the same legacy, Catholic Church is a continuation of the Roman Empire. But Roman swords were found in Tucson, Arizona. Well, of course, there's lots of evidence from many sources that ever since the flood, people have been trading back and forth across the oceans. Uh, Jewish or Hebrew coins from about the time of Christ have been found in Ohio, buried in old mounds. The Hebrews came over here. The Romans came over to America. You know, here we are teaching our kids that Columbus was the first white man to come over here 500 years ago. I'm sorry, that's just not true. Roman artifacts are found in Tucson, Arizona. One of these artifacts, one of these swords, has a dinosaur on it. So I called the guy who has the sword. His name is Tom Peterson, Arizona Historical Society. I said, Tom, the dinosaurs did not live at the same time. Now, wait a minute. Does he know they did not live at the same time, or does he believe they did not live at the same time? See, his, his preconceived idea that evolution is true prevents him from accepting this as, as evidence. All he knows is this can't be legitimate because evolution is true. But if you're willing to quit, get rid of all your prejudices like a scientist is supposed to do and say, hey, hey um, maybe man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. During the age of sailing ships, there are thousands of stories of people sighting sea monsters. Well, you've got to understand, from about the time of Columbus, you know, first guy really to go across the ocean in modern times, there was a thousand year span of history where things were very suppressed. Knowledge was suppressed, you know, the Catholic Church really put the, you know, put the clamps down and they wanted everybody in, in darkness. Um, 
And so Columbus sailed across the ocean. Now, many people have done it before, but there was a, the Dark Ages is a very legitimate um, age in history. They, they're going with a boat, with a sailboat. Sailboats don't make much noise going through the water. Early 1900s, you start developing steam engines, diesel engines, gasoline engines, internal combustion engines. They make a lot of noise. Now, sound travels real fast underwater. You can go un underwater at one end of a lake, have somebody go a long ways away and bang two rocks together underwater, and you'll hear it. Where you couldn't hear it above water, right? Put your head under in the bathtub sometime and just tap on the side of the tub. A light tap that you would never hear in the air, you will hear through the water. So since sound travels much faster and much longer, much farther through water, whales, for instance, can yell at each other or, you know, call to each other a hundred miles away. A whale can, in their songs, they say they can hear them 100 miles away underwater. Okay, during the age of sailing ships, it's pretty quiet going through the water, so my contention is maybe that's why there are so many legends of sea serpents, sea monsters. You would be able to get closer to them because your boat's not making so much noise. Whereas today with your diesel engine, they can hear you coming 100 miles away, and they've learned to avoid the shipping lanes. There are lots of stories of people sighting sea monsters. Missionary Hans Egged reported a sea monster. His great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson, S.M. Um, McAllister, came to a meeting when I spoke up in New England someplace, Delaware, I believe. He said, oh yeah, my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather uh, was Hans Egged. And in his diary, I've got the whole photocopy of the diary in one of my files there, he reported seeing a sea monster that stuck its head up even with one of the top uh, sails on the ship. And it had two little flappers, he called it, flappers. We probably would call it a flipper. And they said it had like a mane running down its back. Of course, it may have been when it came out of the water, the water is still dripping off of its fin, which would make it look like a horse's mane, if the water is still dripping off. Um, Bishop uh, Eric Pontopoden of Norway in 1755 reported that he saw a sea monster. I believe that was off the coast of Greenland, if I, if I remember. Um, this was, no, Hans Egged was off the coast of Greenland. Bishop uh, to Norway, I forget where he saw it, but I've, you can get the book, Monsters of the Sea. I've got most of these books in my library. Captain McKay tells a fascinating story about he was the captain of the HMS Daedalus. In 1848, on August of 1848, they were sailing around and a sea monster swam under their boat. The lookout called for the captain and said, Captain, we got a sea monster out here. So the captain came up on deck, called some more of the crew up there. They watched this sea monster for 20 minutes. He said, it came so close to my boat, if I would have known it, if it would have been, he said, if it would have been a man of mine acquaintance, I could have easily recognized him. He was close enough for me to recognize this creature. He said it was on a steady course, didn't deviate. He said it was going against the wind. And if you read the account that McKay left behind, it just, it rules out all other possibilities that people have tried to use to explain this. Some people say, well, it was just a piece of driftwood. They don't go against the wind. It was going against the wind and against the current. These sailboat captains, you know, take careful records on all that kind of stuff, which way's the current, which way's the wind. I mean, that's, they're very dependent on those things. The sailors on board begged the captain not to mention this in the logbook. They said, Captain, please don't mention this in the logbook. Why would they do that? Yeah, you're gonna, they're going to get laughed at. You go back from a long fishing trip and say, hey, we saw a sea monster. Average landlubber, you know, who doesn't ever go out, he looks at the ocean once in a while. How far out? You can see out five, six miles. The ocean's huge, you know. You look like the idiot Russian astronauts who went up, circled the moon, came back and said, well, we didn't see gods, so we must not exist. <laughs> uh, think about it. You didn't see him, so he doesn't exist. You go out and look at the beach, I don't see any dinosaurs, therefore they don't exist. You know, that's the attitude some people have. For one thing, right now, how much of the ocean would you guess is being observed by people right now? Not much. Ships, even today, ships generally stick to the shipping lanes because they take advantage of the currents. I mean, if you're in a giant boat, you know, carrying a zillion pounds of material, <clears throat> and you're only getting 
You're only going, you know, 11 miles an hour. And you can get in a current that will carry you an extra 3 miles an hour. That cuts four days off your time going across the ocean. Meanwhile, you're paying all this crew four days pay. Well, it just makes common sense, you know. Figure out where the currents are and follow the currents. Which means there are large sections of the ocean that are never sailed over. There's no currents there to take advantage of. Um, in 1850s, there was a whaling ship called the Monongahela. Now, there's a fascinating story. You can get it at UWF Library about the Monongahela. It's in uh, QL89, if you go to the UWF Library. QL89 is the section of the library that has books about Loch Ness Monster and stuff like that. Captain on the board the Monongahela set sail to catch whales. It's a whaling ship. I've read the whole story. I just have a brief synopsis of it here. But the story goes, basically, the lookout hollered down, Captain, there's a sea monster out there. The sea monster was sleeping on some floating uh, seaweed, or kelp, I think it was. The captain called the crew up on deck. They saw the sea monster. Now, this is a whaling ship. These are the guys that get in those little boats and go out there with those big harpoons and stick it inside of a whale. You would have to be pretty brave to do something like that. He said, sailors, um, we have for years heard stories of sea monsters. How many of you have heard stories of sea monsters? And, of course, they all raised their hand. He said, how many of you have laughed at somebody else for claiming they saw a sea monster? Raised their hand. He said, fellas, there's a sea monster. We have two choices. Go back to port, report we saw a sea monster, and get laughed at the rest of our life, or go kill it and prove they exist. Any volunteers to go kill the sea monster? He got enough volunteers to man, I think, three boats, whaling boats. So these guys get their harpoons, they get in these boats, they go out there after the sea monster, which is sleeping, sunbathing or something, on the kelp. They get up beside it and they harpooned it. I think the story says they stuck five harpoons in it. Sea monster, of course, woke up right away, jerked his head around, and they said that the jaw on this creature was about eight feet long. When it came around, it hit the captain, who was standing up in his boat, knocked him out of the boat. The serpent was just twitching around, seeing what stuck me in the side. You know, why do I have a pain here all of a sudden? So he twitches around, knocks the captain unconscious. A couple of sailors jump in, grab the captain, drag him out, put him in the boat, you know, revive him. Meanwhile, this sea serpent slides off the kelp and heads for the bottom. And they have the ropes, and they're pouring water on as this rope is whizzing out over the front of the boat. they got this little thing, the gunwale, I think they call it, where the, the rope goes out. No, the gunwale's the back. But the, the rope goes whizzing out through this little V-shaped thing to keep it in place. And the sea serpent is going to the bottom. They realize they're going to run out of rope, so they tie another rope on. If I remember the story, it's been seven years since I read it, but they, the sea monster went down about 1,500 feet. One or two of the harpoons pulled loose. The other one stuck. There's this sea monster way down underwater with these ropes hooked to harpoons that are still stuck in him. Of course, what a harpoon is supposed to do, it's supposed to, you know, make it bleed to death. That's why they kill the whales. Um, after a long time, I forget, I think it was several hours, but it was quite a while, one of the sailors hollered, he's coming up. The rope is going slack. So they start pulling in the rope, and about an eighth of a mile away from them, the sea monster surfaces, and it's thrashing around as it's dying. They said it apparently had stayed down too long because it, it coughed up its own lungs. Its lungs exploded, and the lungs were hanging out of its mouth. Um, they waited till it thrashed around and died. They dragged it over to the boat and cut it up. They measured it 103 feet long. I believe the number was 103 six inches. I mean, they really measured it. The sailor said it had two blowholes, like a whale does. You have two nostrils. A whale has two blowholes on the back of its head. It had four swim fins, an alligator-like head, and 94 very sharp teeth. A passing ship stopped as the crew was cutting it up, and they bought some barrels of sea serpent oil. Now, the story goes that they, they, this thing had a layer of blubber like a whale does. Whale blubber ranges, you know, say, two feet thick. They would cut off this whale blubber, the fat, on the outside of a whale, 
and boil it down to make whale, uh, whale oil. That's what they used to use. I've heard they still use it to make transmission fluid out of whale oil. But they used to use it in old days for lamps and you know stuff like that. Whale oil was very expensive. A boat could go out. It was very risky business. But if you caught enough whales to fill your uh, boat with uh, whale oil, you could retire after one cruise. But a lot of people went out and died, you know. So it's a risky business. Anyway, whale oil has sort of a red color to it when they boil it down. This sea serpent oil had a layer of blubber, so they boiled it down, and it was clear like water. But it burned just like whale oil. You could use it for lamps, but it was clear oil. Pretty interesting. Um, the other boat that saw these guys, they said, what are you guys doing? They said, we killed a sea monster. Come on over, take a look. So they went over and helped him cut it up and said, we'd like to buy the oil off of you. And we're going to go back home and tell people, we saw a sea monster. We held it in our hands. Here's the oil to prove it. So sure enough, they sailed back home with their sea serpent oil and sell it or whatever and tell their stories. Ha, you guys just wait till the Monongahela gets here. Because they, they, the Monongahela said, well, this is great, but we didn't come out you know, for Sea Monster. Our boss didn't pay us for this. We're supposed to come back with whale oil. We got to go get a few more whales. <clears throat> so they sailed off in search of whales and it was never heard from again. Many years later, a board washed up on a beach on one of the Aleutian Islands down by Alaska. You know, they got the little islands coming off of Alaska. The board was, what, was the, the name board, Monongahela. So that's all we know. It's logical to assume that the ship sank in a storm. Now on board the Monongahela was the bones to the sea serpent. They kept the bones to prove it. But it's in Davy Jones' locker right now. Arthur Henry Rawston was an officer on the Campania, the chief officer. He later was one of the officers on the Titanic and drowned on the Titanic when it went, went down in 1912. But in 1907, he was sailing off the coast of Ireland near the town of Cork. I've been there to preach. He said he saw a long-necked object which he sketched as it moved. It was turning its head from side to side. He drew sketches of it as it moved across. Now notice, Ireland has a spot right here where the ocean comes in and the deep part comes in closer to land. Pensacola has one of those too. You got the, you got the continental shelf where it's not very deep, but there's a little ridge comes up off between Pensacola and Panama City. The Gulf of Mexico has a deep spot that comes in, underwater canyon. You don't notice it when you're going over the top, but I'll show you a map later about that. Anyway, this is where he sighted, sighted this thing off the coast of Cork, Ireland. He said he saw a sea serpent. Now here's the captain of the ship, the chief officer of the ship, okay? Not the captain. This book is called Titanic, Triumph and Tragedy. I want you to notice what the next sentence says. However imaginative the young officer may have been. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you see any prejudice in that statement? In other words, you know, we know he was just imagining this. It can't be true. I would say the author of the book, Titanic, Triumph, and Tragedy, has a prejudice. He believes in evolution. He believes dinosaurs did not live with man. And therefore, whatever the captain saw, it, it can't be a sea monster. It can't be a dinosaur. He said, however imaginative this officer may have been, it did not interfere with his progress in the company's service. It's almost like implying, you know, it really should have. He should have got fired for claiming there was a sea monster because we know they don't exist. He was... Um, he has a prejudice. During World War I, 1915, a German U-boat commander, and this story is told in the book uh, Dinosaurs by Design by Duane Gish, which is here in our repertoire somewhere. Um, he said this German submarine sank a British ship. It exploded and sank quickly. 25 seconds later, there was an explosion. Back in those days, the steam engines on board, if they, when you submerge them in water, the steam engine will explode from cooling too quickly. So probably it sank, the water got to the steam engine and it exploded, or to the engine room, 25 seconds later. He said, pieces of wreckage and among them a gigantic sea animal was shot up out of the water. It was about 60 feet long. He described the sea serpent as having four flippers and an alligator-like head and being about 60 feet long. The captain said, I didn't have a camera at the time and it sank in a few seconds. 
He said, I didn't have time to go down and get my camera. Or I'd have taken a picture of it, of this thing thrashing around as it was dying. One theory is, hey, when a ship sinks, it's a lot of free meat. Sea monsters come to get the sailors. There are stories of octopus pulling ships underwater. In uh, 1989, on Christmas Eve, a sea accident occurred in the southern Philippines off Mantico. Fishermen recovered 12 survivors hanging onto the overturned motorized canoe, as well as the body of a 12-year-old boy, a 12-week-old boy. Survivors claimed that a giant octopus had attacked the vessel, grabbing its pontoons. Uh, one of the people said, the, suddenly the waters began to bubble. Then we saw something that looked like a giant octopus. It was as huge as an imported cow. After the attack, the beast submerged rather than injure any survivors. Interesting. 11 years ago. No, you don't hear about this stuff on the news. Um, there was an octopus that washed up on the beach in St. Augustine, Florida, 100 years ago. There's Dr. Webb standing next to the remains of it. He got cables and horses and, and a bunch of horses and tried to drag this thing up away from the beach because it washed up on the beach once and then another tide took it back out and three months later it was reported again, still floating around. I think it was three months. It was a long time. But uh, this octopus laying on the beach, had, his, the legs had all rotted away, just the stump of the head of the octopus. It was 200 feet across, they estimate it would have been with its legs on weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. See, octopus never stop growing. Neither do reptiles, okay? Neither do squids. A whale was killed near Seattle, Washington. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus that was 150 feet long. All around the side of the whale were scars that were nine inch diameter. See, octopus have those suckers under their arms. They grab onto something and dig into it. Those little, those little suckers actually have little teeth in some of them. They will suck and dig in and tear out a chunk of flesh. Nine-inch diameter scars. Well, there's two theories. One is the whale got attacked when it was a baby. Little normal scars. And as the whale grew, the scars grew. Okay, could be. Or it was attacked when it was older and there was something had nine inch diameter suckers on its arm, which would make it a huge octopus. All they know is they found inside the stomach a 150 foot arm. Now whales love to eat octopus or squid, either one. If a whale eats too much octopus or squid, he'll get sick and puke it back up. And after an octopus has been digested a while and it gets into the whale's intestines, it forms a special substance called ambergris. And if a whale gets sick and pukes up the ambergris, it'll float around in the ocean like a blob of fat. You better grab it because it's worth a fortune. That's what they use to make perfume out of. Whale puke. <laughs> that explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? Yeah. Huh. Look it up in the dictionary. Ambergris. Okay, that'll be a good quiz question. What is the substance uh, you made from... Uh, certain whales that is used to make perfume. It would be ambergris. Here's a picture uh, of a whale attacking a giant squid. There are many reports of this happening. The U.S. Uh, Navy oceanographic research vessel in 1966 was off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, up north of Maine. San Pablo, they observed an encounter between a giant squid and a sperm whale. It's from Peabody Museum at Yale University. The picture's on the wall there. Here I am at Peabody Museum. Over my head is a model of a giant squid. Now, squids and octopus never stop growing. This baby squid washed up on the beach in New Zealand five years ago. They said it was an immature female squid, and full-grown, it would have probably been 150 feet long. A giant squid was captured in uh, Newfoundland in 1878 that was 80 feet long. Now, if you look at a map underwater of Newfoundland, the way the ocean floor has got real deep parts, and it comes up kind of close to the shore, as opposed to a big continental shelf. You know, it just goes out and drops off to the deep. Who knows why? The way the currents are right there, the Gulf Stream and the way the wind patterns are, nobody knows for sure, but there seems to be times when giant squid decide to come up and die and get washed up on shore. So, dinosaurs, I think, have lived with man all through history. 
a giant animal still alive today, some of them, are they in the Bible? What time is it? Oh, man, we've got to quit. We'll cover dinosaurs in the Bible next class. Thank you so much.